today. It's uncertain. It's gonna be a crazy day, Huey. It's also unwritten. You got this. Today is the day we can start to change things. Make things better and make better things. Let's take on problems, big or small. Not yet, I'm coding! Because they're all worth solving. Let's make tech more helpful, more open, and accessible to everyone. Let's keep data safe and people safe. Look after the environment and each other. Today may surprise us, push us, even scare us. That's why we're here. Let's take those challenges and make something even better for tomorrow. Welcome our CEO of Google Cloud, Thomas Kurian. Wow. Hello. Welcome to Cloud Next. It's wonderful to join you from New York to begin our global 24-hour broadcast with keynotes happening live here in New York, San Francisco, Tokyo, Bengaluru, and Munich. It's my pleasure now to kick off today by welcoming Google and Alphabet CEO, Sundar Pichai. Thank you, Thomas. And thanks to everyone joining us today. Wish I could be there with you in person. I'm glad that today's event spans the globe. It's a representation of the hybrid world we live in today. We're honored to build products that help make this hybrid reality work even better. From Google Workspace, the productivity and collaboration apps that help 3 billion users, including us, get things done, to the cybersecurity that keeps customers safe. And we are doing it all on the cleanest cloud in the industry. We are seeing incredible momentum. Cloud is one of our fastest growing businesses. In Q2, we were at a $25 billion annual revenue run rate. Google Cloud helps us advance our mission and makes Google work better. It's what enables us to share innovation and investment from across Google with companies, governments, and organizations worldwide. For example, we developed our global network, including 22 subsea cables to bolster our infrastructure and improve the performance of our products like YouTube. Now it's available to our customers as well. We developed BigQuery to help our search customers. And now every company has access to the most powerful analytics. And because we invested for years in threat analysis to protect everyone who uses Google, we can help provide that same protection to countries and companies with Google Cloud. AI is another really important area for Google Cloud. Google has long been an AI-first company. We've made progress in some of the most challenging areas of research, including translation, computer vision, and natural language processing. These advances are powering helpful product innovations, from enabling people to search using video and text simultaneously, to summarizing long documents and highlighting what matters. Google is also applying cloud AI tools to help solve our own business challenges. I'll give you an example. Google's products are used by people around the world who speak thousands of different dialects and languages. It's really important we can provide translations so everyone can access them. Advances in AI are making it easier to translate languages, including languages that aren't well represented on the web. 
earlier this year, we added 24 new languages to Google Translate with machine learning techniques that can translate new languages without ever seeing a direct translation. Advances like these, along with Google Cloud AutoML and the help of local experts, enable us to translate more content than ever before. Today, we are launching Translation Hub to bring these capabilities to deliver translation at scale for all of you. It is Google Cloud's AI agent that helps companies translate content in over 135 languages. It takes full documents, including images, and translates them while preserving layouts and formatting, enabling researchers to share their findings with global audiences, helps providers of goods and services to reach underserved markets, and governments to better serve all of their constituents. Translation Hub joins other AI agents from Google Cloud that apply AI to common business tasks. Fortune 500 company Avery Dennison is using Translation Hub to translate internal communications and engage employees globally. This capability promotes a more inclusive workplace with employees able to communicate and be understood. Translation is one way AI is becoming more accessible and common. We are seeing more examples every day. During the pandemic, more than half of companies accelerated their AI adoption plans. And 86% said that it's becoming a mainstream technology. We are at a tipping point, and companies are turning to Google Cloud to help. One of the most powerful AI applications for organizations is the ability to extract insights and predictions from their data, specific to their business needs. For example, Munich Re, one of the leading reinsurance companies in the world, is collaborating with Google Cloud to use AI to respond to natural disasters quickly and thoroughly. Our tools help them to build better damage detection models faster and more cost efficiently. This speeds up response time, helping get people and resources where they are needed most. Likewise, Frontier Development Lab, in partnership with NASA, Google Cloud, and others, has created the first 360-degree view of the sun. Using AI, they combine data from three NASA satellites, making it possible to observe the sun from any vantage point. This will help scientists better predict the impact of the sun's activity on our planet. They're also using AI to see the moon's permanently shadowed regions as if it were daylight, an important step in lunar exploration. Finally, they've built models that take existing satellite images and transform them to represent accurate flood predictions. This helps planners and rescue groups anticipate the impact of flooding to better protect communities. Looking ahead, there is a new frontier of computing that will extend this further. From augmented reality that delivers translation and transcription directly in your line of sight, to advances in hardware and software that make it feel like you're in the same room as a coworker miles away. That's a new technology we've been working on called Project Starline. It creates a 3D model of a person, making it feel like you're sitting with someone in the same room, not at the other end of a video call. After thousands of hours of testing in our own offices, including demos with enterprise partners, we are seeing promising results. Users noted the powerful ability to make eye contact and how much more engaged and connected they felt. Today, we are announcing an early access program with enterprise partners, including Salesforce and T-Mobile. Starting this year, we'll begin installing Starline prototypes in select partner offices for daily testing. It's a really exciting next step, and we're looking forward to improving this technology together. When more people, businesses and organizations have access to the power of advanced technologies, amazing things happen. That's what I see as the future of Google Cloud, and we are grateful for the opportunity to partner with you on this journey. Thank you all for being part of Cloud Next, and back to you 
Thomas. Thank you, Sundar. I'd like to thank our sponsors who've helped make this event so successful and who help make our customers successful every day, especially our luminary sponsors, Accenture, Autos, C3 AI, and Deloitte. Now, our vision for cloud computing is to simplify all of the technology that organizations need, making it accessible by simplification to every organization around the world as software platforms that provide the foundation for your business to digitize and accelerate. At Next, you'll hear directly from leading companies in every industry and geography who have accelerated their transformation with Google Cloud. In media, Global live streamed the Tokyo Olympics to all of Latin America and hosted over 55 events. In automotive, Group Renault analyzes more than a billion data sets from their factories every single day, saving more than 100 million euros in 2021 alone. In retail, H&M Group is improving its customer experience and optimizing its internal supply chains. Home Depot saved 30% by consolidating and modernizing its systems. And FNAC RT in France is converting more customers with Google quality search and recommendations. In telecommunications, for instance, Belt Canada is deploying 5G network functions in less than a week compared to the industry standard of over six months. In healthcare, Johns Hopkins Brain Injury Outcomes Division reduced some brain scan review times from five hours to just 30 seconds. We're helping financial services companies transform too. The Chicago Mercantile Exchange, or CME Group, now offers real-time market data for about 90% less cost. Prudential PLC is enhancing health and financial inclusion across all of Africa and Asia. ANZ Bank is giving actionable insights 250 times faster. Commerzbank migrated 135 databases to run on Google Cloud across 35 applications in less than nine months. And Mina Bank in Japan runs its core banking system on Google Cloud. So as you can see, Google Cloud is accelerating the transformation of global leaders in every industry. Google Workspace today helps 8 million customers to transform the way they work, up from 6 million just two years ago. And we continue to be the top cloud for technology companies. Did you know that 70% of the top 100 unicorns in the world run on Google Cloud, including ShareChat in India, Tokopedia in Indonesia, Sift Analytics in Africa, Wix in Europe, and DoorDash in the United States. Now let's hear directly from a few of our customers. Through AI, we can reach more people globally when and where they want it. It's the power of representation. It's giving Spanish-speaking audiences content specifically made for them by them. Analyzing CAT scans for precise information about a patient's lesion used to take over 10 hours, and now we can do this in under two minutes. Sustainability is absolutely critical to our consumers. With Google Cloud, we can build a much more traceable and transparent supply chain. This helps us to stop deforestation and combat climate change. Google Cloud helps us monitor risk across vast amounts of data. We care deeply about the financial well-being of institutions, corporations, and individuals. Data is a foundational need 
for Twitter. And that data is really responsible for connecting people to their interests, connecting interests amongst each other, and having that deeper conversation. You know, last year at Next, we talked about the five most important questions leading companies are asking themselves to ensure they're transforming the fastest. Ford is a leader in the automotive industry, and it's rapidly transforming by adopting technology. We're very proud to have CEO Jim Farley discuss the journey with us. Thanks, Thomas, and hi, everyone. It's so great to be with all of you. At the heart of our business at Ford is a commitment to meet the evolving needs of our customers. Now that is a lot of corporate speak, but I wanna spend time with you today to bring to life our transformation. Technology in particular, digital capability to connect a car, shipping software to cars, allows us to deliver and develop a customer relationship in ways we've never been able to do in 119 years. So this is a really big deal for us at Ford and for me. The real revolution in auto is digital. And Ford intends to lead that revolution. We're turning our vehicles into generators of data that will receive continuous updates. We can ship software directly to the car, delivering incredible value for our customers. Now we're just approaching 5 million software updates. We're leveraging that data in new ways like telematics for our commercial customers in Ford Pro. We see our vehicles being able to do preventable diagnosis themselves for service. We're investing in a whole new generation of talent. Coders, software engineers from so many tech companies wanna join Ford because they know we're gonna ship some great software and some great products. And Thomas, I'm sorry, some of those are coming from Google. Uh, but we're really excited about all the work we're actually doing with Google who is a fundamental change agent for this incredible change to Ford and our customers. We're supercharging our use of AI and ML to drive innovation across our company. We doubled our number of AI-powered solutions last year by putting advanced AI and ML capabilities in the hands of our employees, not just our data scientists. These advanced software tools make EV charging easier, our parts shipment more efficient, they even help us race better on the weekends. We're using Google Data Cloud to power operational data and analytics to improve our manufacturing operations, efficiency and quality. I hear this all the time when I go to our plants. We're glad to be on this journey with a great innovative partner like Google and Google Cloud. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jim. We couldn't be happier to be strategic partners with Ford. Now, data is at the heart of digital transformation. Data is being generated at far greater rates by everything from infrastructure to consumer apps. Everyone wants to access it instantaneously, but it's often trapped in different silos and tools. Google's open data cloud enables you to aggregate and understand all your data from all your sources in all storage formats from all cloud providers and enabling all styles of access. Google's data cloud and BigQuery make it easy for organizations to combine all their structured data from operational databases and software as a service applications like Workday, ServiceNow, Adobe, SAP, and others with unstructured data and semi-structured data such as log files. Did you know that over 90% of Google Data Cloud customers also access and analyze data from other clouds using Google's Data Cloud? BigQuery Omni allows you to analyze data stored in AWS, Azure, and others without needing to actually move the data, saving egress fees. From BigQuery then, customers can use SQL queries, programs written in Spark, and built-in machine learning capabilities to analyze the data. Albertsons, a leading grocery retailer, uses Google's data cloud and BigQuery Omni 
to analyze its supply chain and order management data from both Azure and Google Cloud to improve inventory planning. BigQuery also supports key storage formats for data lakes and lake houses through Big Lake. Big Lake now supports Apache Iceberg with the popular Delta and Hootie formats coming very soon. Users can now analyze and visualize all this data using two styles of analysis. Governed analysis, often used for official reporting and embedded in applications, and self-service analysis, which is more distributed, typically used for departmental reporting and dashboards. Google has two popular tools used by 10 million users each month for both these styles of analysis. Looker, which is widely used for governed data access, and Data Studio, a leading self-service tool for reporting dashboards and data visualization. Today, we're announcing that we're unifying them with Looker and Looker Studio to give self-service analysts access to secure and governed data along with enterprise support and governance capabilities. Customers such as Wayfair are super excited about this integration. Looker also works with other popular tools like Tableau, and today we're announcing a preview of Looker support for Power BI. Let's take a look at where BI can take each and every one of you. Google products provide the information you need when you need it. But why can't you get the same kind of answers for your business? Looker, Google Cloud's business intelligence solution is here to solve that problem, enabling you to go beyond traditional dashboards and make your organization's information accessible and useful. Bringing this innovation to business will be revolutionary, just like navigating a city after Google Maps. Looker is Google for your business data. Here's what we mean. What if Google AI were built into the tools you use to store and analyze data at work? Google's Vertex AI Vision takes data like video, images, and audio, and in real time, turns it into structured data, ready for business intelligence. Going beyond the dashboard means using Google Glass Enterprise to see insights and recommendations based on your data in real time. More access, more transparency. Now that's Google for your business. With Google Maps, you know if a restaurant is busy before you go, or you can get rerouted around a traffic jam. Looker will help you connect similar dots in a predictive way. A concert in five days will increase foot traffic by 65%. Would you like to adjust staffing and inventory? Yes. Looker and AI lets you respond to changes in demand and turn insights into action. Foot traffic continues to be busy. Encourage customers to visit an alternate shop with a reward card? Yes. Smarter insights mean better experiences and happy customers. So go beyond the dashboard and transform the way you do business with Looker, powered by Google Cloud. You know, data becomes even more powerful when it's used in concert with AI and machine learning. Let me introduce Jun Yang, Google's Cloud's Vice President of AI and Industry Solutions, to tell you more about our vision. Thank you, Thomas. Much of the data generated these days are videos. In the past, getting useful insights from video streams in a secure and cost-effective manner has been challenging. Today, I'm excited to announce Vertex AI Vision, a fully managed end-to-end -end application development environment to help developers build and deploy computer vision application easily. Let's use Vertex AI Vision for a smart city use case. Let's start by ingesting multiple video streams from traffic cameras located at busy intersections throughout the city. Next, we'll use a simple drag and drop user interface. We can choose from a library of pre-built AI models. Let's go ahead and select the occupancy analytics model for our application. Next, we will select BigQuery to store the streaming data and the model outputs. Now, 
we're ready to deploy the application. We can use the model outputs to perform time series forecast with BigQuery and predict future traffic patterns. As you can see, with Vertex AI Vision, developers can reduce the time required to build and deploy computer vision application from weeks to hours. An organization can create and run this application at a fraction of the cost. Stay on the topic of AI. Sundar just announced Translation Hub, our AI agent for self-serve document translation that's built for enterprises. AI agents are out-of-box solution that let everyday people apply AI to common business tasks. For example, contact center AI helps call center reps serve customers better. Similarly, document AI helps accelerate the interpretation and analysis of documents. Zooming in on Translation Hub. As a public health official, I need to translate this document to 50 languages. Normally, I would have to send this to a vendor, wait for two weeks to get this translation back. With Translation Hub, I can do it in minutes. First, I will import my document from Google Drive into Translation Hub. Next, I will select the template with my preferences, including 50 target languages and domain-specific AI model that provides a higher quality translation out of box. Now, I'm ready to translate. In seconds, I get high quality translation in all 50 languages while preserving all the layout, colors, graphics, and fonts. To refine the translation further, I have the option to use human in the loop capability in Translation Hub and the route the document to a localization expert for review. Experts can now review and edit based on the uh, prediction marker posted at a per sentence level. When all the edits are done, Translation Hub will rebuild the documents. Now they're ready for distribution. With Translation Hub, we can translate content to 135 languages with full layout retention and build in human in the loop content review capabilities. Thanks to the power of AI, document translation can now be done quickly, at scale, and cost effectively. Back to you, Thomas. Thank you, June. Our open data cloud simplifies access to data from software as a service applications. With SAP, we have created a framework with predefined integrations, BigQuery data models, and out-of-the-box reports. For ATB financials, month-end processes that used to take five hours now run in just seconds. Rodan and Fields can now analyze shopping behavior and forecast their sales more accurately. Further, over 800 software partners are building their products using our data cloud. And 17 of the most influential data companies have joined us today in the Data Cloud Alliance to commit to open standards and interoperability. Today, we're pleased to announce that we've expanded our partnerships with MongoDB, Elastic, Calibra, Palantir, ServiceNow, and many more. We also have a new partnership with Sisu Data. Now let's talk about developers and builders. Today, developers have more options than ever before. But this array of choices has often led to complexity, a loss of developer productivity, and have often exposed developers to software vulnerabilities. To address these challenges at Google Cloud, we have created opinionated golden paths, starting all the way from the IDE through the build, deploy, and operations process to help developers create software faster and more securely. Today, we're launching Software Delivery Shield, which provides a fully managed end-to-end -end software supply chain security solution from source to deployment. It has four important components. First is cloud workstations, now in public preview. Instead of being just another cloud-hosted IDE, 
Cloud Workstations provides a secure developer environment, especially for remote developers and contractors who work with sensitive data. Second, with our assured open source software service, Google now scans, analyzes, and fuzz tests over 250 of the most widely used Java and Python packages, providing you with secure software libraries that you can depend on. Third, Cloud Build, our continuous integration service, now provides support for Salsa Level 3 compliance by default. Salsa is an emerging open standard to ensure that the software you use or your software supply chain is secure. Fourth, the new GKE Security Management Dashboard provides you with opinionated guidance to improve the security posture of your container workloads. In addition to helping you build more securely, we're also announcing a number of advances to help you build more productively. With streamlined environments centered around popular developer stacks, including Flutter and Firebase, MongoDB Atlas, Angular, and Node.js on Cloud Run, and collaborative development using Replit. To simplify how you scale and operate environments, we continue to advance GKE Autopilot. It enables developers to deploy and scale containerized applications over two and a half times faster than the competition. Customers like Lowe's are already benefiting. Their development team now builds faster from one release every two weeks to over 20 releases every day. The team at Allstate built an application in just 90 days to show customers how to more clearly and securely protect their homes. To help developers learn faster, we were the very first cloud provider to launch a learning subscription. Today, we're super excited to combine those learning benefits with new perks, including cloud credits, certification exam vouchers, live learning events, and even unique access to some of our superstar Google engineers and more. Now let's talk about IT people who build the infrastructure for transformation. Cloud infrastructure needs to change in two fundamental ways. First, Customers increasingly want to use cloud infrastructure for new types of workloads. Second, with Moore's Law slowing, new infrastructure advances are required to deliver performance improvements. We call this at Google Workload Optimized Infrastructure, and we're optimizing for seven key workloads. For AI optimized infrastructure, we built the Tensor Processing Unit. TPU version 4 is now generally available and runs large-scale training workloads up to 80% faster and 50% cheaper. LG AI Researched used TPUs to train an AI model that has 300 billion parameters, outperforming other best-in-class computing infrastructure. To extend our AI infrastructure, today we are pleased to announce a deeper strategic partnership with NVIDIA. Together, we're committed to support AI workloads using NVIDIA's latest technology from GPUs through to managed services from NVIDIA and AI models from Google. Google and NVIDIA are also partnering to promote open source and collaborating on open AI frameworks, including OpenXLA, JAX, and MonAI. For high-performance computing, we're announcing two new offerings in preview. For HPC Compute, new C3 instances include the Intel Sapphire Rapid Processor with 200 gigabits per second networking, the highest available in the cloud. For high-performance storage, we offer new hyperdisk system which delivers 80% higher IOPS by decoupling compute instance sizing from storage performance. 
We're also partnering with HPC leaders, including Cadence and Ansys, to optimize the performance and scale, as well as to simplify the deployment of their software in our cloud. For media streaming, we built Media CDN using our global network and our experience with YouTube. Media companies like Paramount Plus are able to deliver flawless experiences using Media CDN. For customers in regulated markets and countries with sovereignty laws, we offer sovereignty-optimized workloads. Assured workloads allow you to configure a regulatory compliant environment in just minutes. And local controls are hosted with partners such as T-Systems in Germany and Talos in France. For more traditional workloads, we're announcing new capabilities. First, with VMware Engine Universal Integration, enabling you, as a user, to create and migrate VMware workloads directly from the VMware console. We're also announcing Dual Run, a new capability to re-host mainframe workloads in the cloud. The most new projects want cloud-first optimized workloads. To simplify operations, we've automated managing and scaling clusters with GKE Autopilot and Anthos Multi-Cluster Management. To bring you edge computing, Google Distributed Cloud Edge, powered by Anthos, provides you a fully managed edge for low latency applications. It's being used to power telecommunications networks at Bell and Geo, and is modernizing retail stores in many countries. We're also creating Web3 optimized infrastructure. Web3 leaders like Near, Nansen, Solana, BlockDemon, Dapper Labs, and Sky Mavis use Google Cloud so they can focus on innovation. And today, I'm excited to announce an important new partnership with Coinbase. Let's welcome Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong to share more. Thanks, Thomas. We're excited to be working with Google Cloud on this partnership. Coinbase has more than 100 million verified users, more than 14,000 institutional clients, and we've spent more than a decade building industry-leading products on top of blockchain technology. We see our collaboration with Google as an opportunity to bring Web3 to a new set of users and provide powerful solutions to founders and developers. There are four key aspects to our partnership. First, Coinbase will be using Google Cloud to build advanced data and analytics capabilities to better serve our customers. Google Cloud BigQuery will serve as the centerpiece of this new data processing architecture, while Vertex AI will enable Coinbase machine learning engineers to train and deploy models more rapidly and at greater scale than ever before. Combined, this new platform will enable Coinbase to streamline and rapidly scale its data processing and machine learning capabilities without being hindered by the complexity and cost of managing underlying infrastructure. Second, Coinbase Commerce enables merchants around the world to be able to accept crypto payments. Through this partnership, we're looking forward to enabling this for Google Cloud's customers and partners so that they can pay for cloud services with crypto. Third, developers will have access to Google Cloud's blockchain data through BigQuery, and this new offering will be powered by Coinbase Cloud's node service. The integration will allow developers to instantly and reliably operate Web3-based systems without the need for expensive and complex infrastructure. And finally, Google will use Coinbase Prime for institutional crypto services like secure custody and reporting. We could not ask for a better partner to execute our vision of building a trusted bridge into the Web3 ecosystem. I started Coinbase with a desire to create a more accessible financial system for everyone. And Google's history of supporting open source and decentralized ecosystems made this a natural fit. With this partnership with Google Cloud, we've now been able to power some of that with Coinbase Cloud, and so those services will be exposed into Google Cloud. Developers can go in there and access the whole world of blockchain data, build Web3 apps very quickly without having to kind of manage and run their own nodes for all the different types of blockchains out there. So I imagine there's more and more things that we can do over time. I mean, basically, we want to make 
commerce on the internet uh, much more global and fair and free, democratized. And I think crypto is kind of that native currency of the internet. So hopefully Google and Coinbase can kind of integrate more and more things over time to power the global internet economy. All right, well, thank you. Back to you, Thomas. Thank you, Brian. Google is excited to partner with you. In order to support all of these workloads, we're continuing to invest and expand our global footprint. I'm excited to share that we're announcing new cloud regions in five countries, Austria, Norway, South Africa, Sweden, and Greece. We now have 48 regions live or announced. Now let's talk about security people. Cybersecurity teams face a shortage of skilled professionals and threats that are growing every day in scale, sophistication, and impact. It's our responsibility to protect your privacy and security in every product we make so that every day you're safer with Google. At Google Cloud, we've engineered security into our platform rather than bolting it on. Security operations are simplified, and shared responsibility evolves to shared fate. Our commitment to you is twofold. First, we keep you secure from cyber attacks using the expertise we've gleaned from securing our own business, our own technology infrastructure, and our billions of users. We simplify your security and compliance with our assured workload service. We deliver invisible zero trust security with Beyond Corp, ensuring that access to services are granted only to authenticate and authorized users. We protect applications from abuse and fraud with reCAPTCHA. And we provide you with the world's largest threat observatory with VirusTotal. So in short, you know what we at Google know. Second, to help you quickly and effectively identify and resolve cyber threats, we're excited to unveil Chronicle Security Operations, our suite that consolidates security analytics, security automation, and threat intelligence. Cyber security teams can now detect investigate and respond to threats with the speed, scale, and intelligence of Google. Take Vertiv, a leading provider of equipment and services for data centers. Vertiv uses Chronicle to ingest, analyze, and retain all security telemetry. Vertiv now analyzes 22 times more security data, responds to three times more security events, and has reduced investigation time by 50% with security queries now taking just seconds. Our next step with cybersecurity is to bring Mandiant and its cybersecurity experts and products to Google Cloud. Please welcome Mandiant CEO Kevin Mandia to tell you more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Moore's Law may be slowing down, but threat actors in cyberspace are not. Uh, our mission at Mandiant has always been to secure companies and make them confident in their readiness as they operate their businesses. And to scale this vision, we want to take our security expertise and our threat intelligence and make it software available to all companies. And this is something we've been focused on for a long time. Mandian is known for being, I believe, the best in the world at threat intelligence. We were designed to know more about threat actors than anybody else on the planet. And we are now combining our security expertise and our threat intel with the AI and compute speed and analytics of Google so we can bring this vision to everyone. And as a result, we can effectively automate the often human intensive process of understanding the threat actors, find the needle in the haystack, and be able to do shields up against these attacks. And together, we can deliver on that shared mission of a more secure world. Now, security teams always ask, whenever executive staff read the headlines, hey, will that attack work on us? With Mandiant, 
you can answer that question. We have hundreds of researchers around the globe that speak over 30 languages, that reside in over 25 countries, that research with great rigor and discipline and catalog the fingerprints of all the intruders. One example of this is a group that we call FIN12. And FIN12 is a prolific ransomware actor. And during 2018 through 2020, they were targeting hospitals and healthcare facilities to make money and conduct crime. And we had the fingerprints of FIN12. And in 2020, we identified these TTPs, or tools, tactics, and procedures, and we were able to bring them to our customers. Because they used new and novel attacks that circ they circumvented conventional safeguards, we knew that our intel would be critical for our customers. And we brought that information to our customers so that they could do shields up and defend themselves. Now, having these early warning signs or these indicators is critical for an organization to operate confidently in cyberspace. And many times, if FIN12 was in your network, you only had an hour or so to do something about it before you had a significant impactful breach. So with Google Cloud, we're able to analyze what's currently happening as well as historical data in Chronicle and use machine learning and data analytics to find that proverbial needle in the haystack, in this case, FIN12, but we know about the new and novel and we learn more every single day. We can put the defenses in without requiring you to do any manual work at all. Once we know how the attackers operate, and we're usually the first to know, we can help customers take the preventive measures necessary to operate with confidence. One of those measures is security validation, where we take the attacks we're aware of, allow you to run them in a safe and simple way to see how you do against them and get unvarnished truth whether you're secure or not. Another thing we do with our threat intelligence is we do attack surface management and let you know where your vulnerabilities are so you can do something about it. Now, I'm a big proponent of Google Cloud's shared fate model. By taking an active stake in the security posture of all of our customers, we can help organizations find and validate potential security issues before they become an impactful breach. We're excited for the future where Mandiant and Google Cloud can give customers the latest threat intelligence and cyber expertise at compute speed, delivered automatically through SaaS products and backed by the leading managed services and consulting services available. Back to you, Thomas. Thank you, Kevin. We're combining the expertise of Google and Mandiant with many leading cybersecurity partners to further simplify and enhance your security. To simplify multi-vendor security, we enable customers now to use the preferred identity provider, including Okta, Ping, ForgeRock, or JumpCloud, so there's no need to maintain identities in multiple places. We've launched a new Google Cloud-ready sovereignty solutions program with Palo Alto Networks, Thales, Symantec, and many more partners. And all leading endpoint security vendors, including CrowdStrike, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, and Cyber Reason, have built solutions with the Google Cloud. We intend to keep expanding our open security ecosystem with all endpoint and other third-party security solutions to keep you secure. Now, the success of any organization hinges on unlocking the talent and productivity of its people. With hybrid work, the physical office is no longer the sole space in which people work together. This shift to hybrid has been a once-in-a-generation disruption for millions of organizations around the world. But Google Workspace was built for this very moment. Workspace is the world's most popular productivity tools with over 3 billion users and more than 8 million paying customers. Organizations don't choose Workspace to simply replace their existing tools. 
they choose to transform it the way in which they work. I'm pleased now to invite Aparna Papu, who leads Google Workspace, to share more about the direction with Workspace. Thank you, Thomas. Those are phenomenal numbers. But these aren't just numbers to us. They're real people, real organizations. And our mission is to meaningfully connect people so that they can create, build, and grow together. Every time you use Gmail, Calendar, Docs, Drive, Chat, Google Meet in your daily life, you are using Workspace. Today, we need to think about the nature of work a bit differently. To provide the right physical and digital spaces for every type of employee. For example, manufacturing or healthcare workers typically need to be on site full time. Creatives, on the other hand, might decide to come into the office for the occasional ideation session, but the rest of the time, they need a rich digital workspace. This creates a gap in experience. To close that gap, and to help organizations thrive in a hybrid world, we've invested heavily in Smart Canvas, our next generation collaboration experience, and immersive connections, our approach to bringing people together through our communication products. With Smart Canvas, a simple at mention pulls in the right people, data, insights, and a workflow directly in the places where you're already working. And now, Smart Canvas is extensible to third-party applications like Salesforce, Zendesk, Figma, and many more. Immersive Connections collapses the boundary between people, locations, and devices, making every interaction feel as if you're actually together. Features in our Google Meet product, like automatic light adjustments, so wherever you're working, you look your best. Noise cancellation and mobile companion as a second screen make it easier for people to be seen and heard, whether you're in the office or at home. And now we're taking a step further with immersive connections with speaker spotlight in Google Slides, collapsing the boundary between the story and the storyteller. All of this built on a secure, private, and compliant platform. We're extending our confidentiality with client-side encryption, now in Gmail and Google Calendar, and our support for global data loss prevention in real time in Google Chat. Stepping back, let's look at the digital workspace of the future. Do we really think that people are going to be searching for content, importing images, fussing with fonts, and wrestling with templates in a manual way? Here at Google, we, we envision a whole new era of communication, expression, and co-creation, all powered by incredible advancements in artificial intelligence, an era in which storytelling is richer, more expressive, and frankly, more fun. Where generative AI unleashes people's creativity and unlocks new workflows. Let's look at an example of how we might see this come to life here in Workspace. Amanda is a marketer at a running shoe company, a footwear company. And she's been tasked with creating a video to introduce their brand new zero carbon, high performance running shoe. To get started, she collects relevant data and assets. Then she might type something like this, create a 90 second video for a campaign with using our brand guidelines of people running, make it outdoorsy, and maybe add some upbeat music. With the power of Google AI, Workspace takes all of this in and suggests several different creative directions for her to choose from. She likes the look of the mountain concept, and that's the one she picks. 
she begins to refine the idea. With the help of intelligent suggestions and iterations, she makes a few changes until she finally lands on something she loves. When Amanda's ready, she sends it to her team for review and collaboration. Of course, the team has some ideas. Google AI suggests applying some of their feedback, and Amanda accepts those suggestions and actions it directly in Google Chat. Just like that, she has a killer launch video. This is just one scenario in our mission to help people connect, create, build, and grow together. Back to you, Thomas. Thank you, Aparna. When it comes to climate change, people, governments, and corporations are more motivated than ever before, but they need access to the right information to measure and improve upon their ESG commitments. Google's search interest for how to reduce my carbon footprint has risen by 460% over the past 10 years. Today, Google Cloud is making it easier for our customers to make better sustainability decisions every single day. I'm pleased to announce that Google Cloud carbon footprint is now generally available and free for every user in the cloud console so that you can see and optimize your carbon impact. Our company, Shopify uses detailed emissions data to drive their mission to be the lowest carbon commerce platform. Earlier this year, we announced the general availability of Earth Engine on Google Cloud for better climate risk prediction and resilience. For Natural Resources Canada, Earth Engine on Google Cloud helps map the tree canopy and support models for permafrost, crop status, and water resources. With this data, provinces can monitor their land status and identify how to rehabilitate and transform these sites. Google Maps recently expanded our eco-friendly routing features to 40 new countries in Europe. I'm pleased to share that eco-friendly routing is coming soon to Google Maps platform on Google Cloud for developers and the transportation industry. Ride-sharing and delivery companies, for instance, can embed eco-friendly routes into their driver apps. To provide customers sustainability data sets and solutions, we have over 20 partners with a Google Cloud-ready sustainability designation, and a new partnership with Dun & Bradstreet and Climate Engine. Now, as we wrap this keynote, I want to share my appreciation for all of the people who are building and transforming their business with Google Cloud. On behalf of our teams, we're excited to develop technology with you today to help each of you create a more amazing and a better tomorrow. Thank you so very much, and enjoy the rest of Google Cloud Next. Hi, I'm Shaquille O'Neal, and I'm the founder of Big Chicken. When you're trying to build a national chain, communication is so critical. To do that, you need a great partner. And we're really lucky that partner is Google Workspace. Google Calendar is my girlfriend. I don't know anything I'm doing unless I talk to my woman. Google Workspace, productivity and collaboration tools for all the ways you work.
Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Mr. Bikram Bedi, Managing Director, Google Cloud India. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. It is my privilege to kick off this event today. This is such an awesome day to have so many developers and IT practitioners here with us. Let's begin next 22 with a message from Google Cloud CEO, Thomas Korean. Video, please. Hello, India. This year's Google Cloud Next is being held around the entire world, in New York, California, Tokyo, and now to Nama, Bangalore. I'm honored to join you today alongside the launch of our largest ever regional developer event, Innovators Hive. Navigating these past two and a half years has been a challenge for organizations as they grapple with changing customer demand and growing economic uncertainty. One trend that has quickly emerged is that leading companies across every industry around the globe have realized that digital transformation has to be an urgent priority for business recovery and future growth. For example, in retail, we've all seen the shift to e-commerce. In manufacturing, we're seeing a rise of the digital factory. And in finance, we've seen a sharp increase in online banking and insurance. A lot of cloud work to date has been focused on cost optimization, reducing cost by moving technology to the cloud and by using collaboration tools to be more efficient. As we look forward, companies and customers want more than just cost optimization. They also want value creation. Cloud has to deliver more value and more innovation to organizations. That's why our mission at Google Cloud is to help accelerate every organization's ability to digitally transform its business. And we've been proud to partner with leading companies in every industry, like Reliance Geo, HDFC Bank, ShareChat, Flipkart, and the Adani Group to enable their growth and to solve their most critical business and technology problems. We believe our success comes when our customers and partners succeed, and our partner ecosystem continues to grow. A great example of this is our work with partners, including Accenture, Deloitte, Searcy, NTT, NetMagic, and Tech Mahindra, to provide customers with choice and solution completeness to support industry-focused digital transformation. We're also pleased to be impaneled by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. This impanelment enables the Indian public sector, including government agencies at the center and state levels, and public sector units in power, transportation, public financial services, and others to deploy on Google Cloud. We're committed to the digital transformation of all businesses across India. And we continue to invest in our cloud regions to support sovereignty, security, and sustainability requirements while we create more value together on your terms. We look forward to continuing to partner with you and helping each of you take advantage of all the benefits our transformative and open cloud has to offer. Thank you again for joining us today, and I hope you each enjoy Google Cloud Next. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you for all your support. Uh, I'm sure all of you enjoyed that. The story of India's digital transformation has captured imagination globally. And the audience, all of you who are present here today, are one of the key catalysts of this phenomenon. I think all of you are going to agree with me when I say that the power of cloud computing, 
With that, we are able to build scalable and sustainable solutions right here in India. Our mission at Google Cloud is to accelerate every organization's ability to digitally transform its business. The building blocks of this journey, they, they, they really are the engineering and the developer communities. And all of you, the Indian developers, are truly shaping the future of technology. And our country is uniquely placed to continue driving innovation and building what's next. People in this room, again, all of you, you've basically put India on the global map as the innovation powerhouse with the largest developer community in the world. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, analytics, these are just as foundational for startups today as cloud storage was 15 years ago. Similarly, Google Cloud is now the platform of choice for industry disrupting up and coming unicorn organizations. The tech startup industry is constantly evolving and understanding its role in the post-pandemic world. For example, one of our customers, ShareChat, they migrated their operations when they had 60 million subscribers as their base. And this happened during the pandemic. Currently, they have 340 million monthly active users across all their platforms. This includes launching Moj. You must have seen it, ShareChat. It's their uh, you know, flagship, uh, flagship short format video uh, app that they have. And they launched it just in a week's time. The power of cloud technology enabled ShareChat to scale and innovate. Another example that we have is with our customer Mahindra and Mahindra, the auto giant. They recently had a new launch. Uh, this was for their SUV, uh, Scorpio, uh, Scorpio N. I think some of you in this room may have booked. Uh, the launch was a recreation of India's most iconic SUV brands. It was expected to generate huge public interest. Now Mahindra and Mahindra partnered with us at Google Cloud. And we built an architecture that supported the scale they expected on the launch portal on the day of the launch. In collaboration with Mahindra and Mahindra, we built an architecture to scale with a strong security posture. That was like table stakes. And this launch was a grand success. This happened a couple of months ago, resulting in the Scorpio N reaching 25,000 bookings in the first one minute. 100,000 bookings in 30 minutes and an X showroom value, thank you, an X showroom value of $2.3 billion, Scorpio N. And all of this was powered by Google Cloud. With flexible cloud infrastructure and the containerized approach to scale enabled by GKE, customers are successfully scaling their business on Google Cloud. Ours is the most developer-friendly cloud providing all of you with the technology, the tools, and the open approach that you need to innovate and build for the future. Open source is a key driver of innovation, and developers want to work with open source technologies. With its long history in Kubernetes, containers, open source is in our DNA at Google. Additionally, Anthos gives developers a platform that enables them to build across multiple environments. Finally, as Thomas mentioned, we announced our Delhi NCR region. Uh, this was announced uh, last year to support customers and the public sector, government workloads. We are very proud to announce that our cloud regions in Delhi NCR and Mumbai are now empaneled by Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. And this certification, it enables us at Google Cloud to join a list of approved cloud service providers that meet predefined government standards of quality, availability, and security. And we are authorized to offer solutions now to government, government-owned entities. All our services now are, are available to them. Before I sign off, it is my pleasure uh, to unveil our latest brand film. This film celebrates the unwavering spirit and entrepreneurship of our Google Cloud customers. These customers are building for tomorrow today. Built on Google Cloud, 
and Google Workspace, these solutions help solve real world challenges for millions of consumers. Watch this film and get inspired. Video please. Koi problem solve karne ke liye kiski zarurat hoti hai? Vishwas. Khud mein, khud ki kabiliyat mein. विश्वास की प्रॉब्लम सॉल्व हो सकती है विश्वास जो हर फसल को सफल कर दे जो इंग्लिश न जानने की शर्म मिटा दे जो बढ़ने की चाह को राह दिखाए कुछ बदलने नहीं वाला तो सब बोलते हैं पर कभी कभी सोचना पड़ता है कैसे बदलेंगे प्रॉब्लम्स के रूप तो बदलते जाएंगे लेकिन हम एक ही नारा लगाएंगे सोल्यूशन हम बनाएंगे हम बनाएंगे हम बनाएंगे जी हाँ हम बनाएंगे वी आर एक्साइटेड टू शेप इंडिया डिजिटल फ्यूचर Let's build this future together. Thank you. Our next presenter is well known in the engineering and developer community. He has been the heart and mind behind many of Google products and services that you know today. Please welcome Senior Vice President for Infrastructure Google Cloud, Urs Oslai. Hi everyone, thank you for having me here in India and I have to say it is so great to be back in person to see all of you because today is going to be all about you uh, developers. Uh, and in fact, India is such a cool place to be, especially if you're in technology because India continues to be a foundation of global innovation because after all, India is the inventor of the original wireless communication technology all the way back in 1895 when Sir Jagadish Chandra Bose first demonstrated using radio waves for communication. And then a little bit later in 1930, C.V. Raman became the first Asian to receive a Nobel Prize in any scientific uh, discipline because his discoveries remain incredibly important uh, to telecommunications even today, which is why we've celebrated his uh, 125th birthday with a Google Doodle, and why we are naming our upcoming cable from Europe to India, Blue Raman. Yeah. And then uh, a little bit closer to the present, let's not forget people like uh, AJ Bott, who invented the USB serial bus that we're all using. Yeah. So um, really, throughout time, you know, India has shown how technology changes the world, and we continue to see that today. Because developers in India are turbocharging businesses, uh, big and small. Uh, take, for example, Mahindra Group, where developers are fundamentally, fundamentally uh, rewiring the core operations of one of the largest multinational corporations in the world. Uh, Mahindra is on GCP infrastructure, of course, and uses uh, data and AI services to bring all of their enterprise applications under a single platform. So now they can get real-time insights uh, to best support their global customers from your aerospace to education. And breakthrough companies like Roposo are changing the world of social media by combining it with retail. And developers there built a service that reached 120 million daily active users in just 20 months. They are using Google Cloud, of course, and the AI services to uh, serve personalized content uh, for Roposo's next generation experience and their creators, their influencers, 
in their communities. So yeah, India is way cool. And that's why Google has been investing so much here. In fact, uh, two years ago, we announced the Google for India Digitization Fund for creating uh, digital growth in India. And we committed to an investment of 75,000 core, or about 10 billion US dollars, over the next uh, five or seven years. And we did this to ensure that you all receive more affordable access to information in your own language to help your businesses use cloud technology and leverage AI, and to support rural communities so that they also can uh, join the technology revolution. And since that time, we've also partnered with Airtel to help grow the cloud ecosystem for small and uh, medium-sized uh, businesses. And we also run accelerators dedicated to supporting uh, Indian startups and tech companies uh, like Mind Your Fleet and, and Tireplex. And of course, we have invested in a cloud presence in India with two cloud regions, one in Delhi, one in Mumbai, uh, each having free availability zones. Now we see such powerful work uh, coming from India, backed by the massive developer demand for our cloud services. There are only, uh, oh, there are over, not only, there are over four million developers like you uh, in India, and that's expected to grow to a staggering seven million uh, in 2025. And that's over 16% of the worldwide developer population. So you all really have a massive opportunity to continue to impact the world with technical expertise. And in fact, when we look at our developer program, Google Cloud Innovators, a full 27% of them come from India. And the broader APAC region makes up 39%. And we learned so much from you, from your usage, your feedback, and we absolutely love your enthusiasm for cloud technology. So thank you, thank you, thank you. But another reason we get excited about uh, working with you all is that you are very progressive in how you think about technology adoption. And that's why we like to release new technologies in India first before other countries. And in fact, we did this uh, very recently in June with a Payment Gateway. This is a new API-based payment product, uh, thank you, that allows companies to process payments reliably at scale. And it helps their customers more easily predict uh, their costs because it's simply based on the number of transactions. But now, if you want to hear something else that is cool, because I'm hoping that you will let me geek out a little bit on a piece of hardware that probably none of you have ever heard of. Because my other job is building cloud infrastructure, and its goal really is to be invisible so that you can all uh, have developer experiences without having to worry about sort of what's underneath. Uh, and so I'll show you today a little piece of hardware that is called the optical circuit switch. Because you see in our data centers, we obviously have thousands or hundreds of thousands of servers. And they're all connected with fiber to thousands of switches. And these switches, in turn, are connected to each other. And so when we install new racks with new switches, they, these connections need to be rewired because those new switches have to be linked in to the mesh of the existing switches. And that's where the optical sw circuit switch come in. Imagine doing this rewiring of all these connections in a complicated pattern manually. Right? It's, it's, it's really impossible to do, almost. So we built an optical switch from scratch to do all of this in a programmable way. And here's how it works. So you see uh, uh, you have all these hundreds of fibers coming in each thinner than a strand of hair, and carrying a laser beam with the data. And all of these beams have to be perfectly aligned, so they hit this array of tiny mirrors here. And by tiny, I mean tiny, because this is a greatly magnified picture 
of this chip with this micromirror array. And in reality, each of these mirrors is less than a millimeter wide. And they can be all be adjusted independently by applying some voltage to it. And so as I said, the laser light comes in on one side. Uh, and now we need to aim those mirrors so price precisely that the laser beam perfectly hits the end of an outgoing fiber strand, and so that the data can go to its destination on the other end. And that's why it's really amazing that it works at all. Imagine having to hit something that is thinner than a strand of hair head on with a laser going through mirrors. But it does work, and it works really well. Thank you. And it's been a workhorse, really, in our data centers in 2015. And so I'm guessing you never really thought about that problem. And in fact, you don't have to, because that is our goal for infrastructure, to be invisible, to allow you to build awesome developer experiences uh, and never have to worry about any of this. But now, back to you developers, uh, because you're increasingly becoming the technical decision makers uh, in your organizations, because executives ask your opinions on how to achieve business goals with technology and what products and services to use and, and how to use it and how to deploy them. And so as you continue to play a bigger and bigger role in supporting the broader uh, company goals through technology, uh, you'll need to uh, increase your commitment to learn new skills. And not surprisingly, India is leading the world here as well. In fact, the number of Google Cloud learners in India has grown seven times in the last two years. Right? And globally, yeah, seven times. It's really amazing. Right? And globally, all our developers, customers, partners have earned more than one million Google Cloud credentials uh, to date. And that's, of course, great news because the demand for Google Cloud experts is really huge. But it also means that the industry still has to do a lot to further grow and address this global shortage of skilled experts. So last year, we announced a pretty bold goal of equipping 40 million people with cloud skills in the next five years. And also last year, we introduced Google Cloud Skills Boost, a new online learning and skills development and certification platform that's managed and delivered directly by Google. And today, we're expanding Google Cloud Skills Boost uh, and its learning subscription, uh, built for developers uh, who are looking to accelerate their professional skills and their business growth. Uh, the annual subscription now includes uh, what we call Innovation Plus, a set of new developer benefits like cloud credits, certification exam vouchers, uh, live learning events, and a ton more. And you can uh, sign up today, uh, starting today, at this link. So Google Cloud really offers an incredible array of services, and you know more are coming out every month. But with training programs like these, you can stay up to date, be a core contributor, and help your company achieve its goals with cloud uh, technology. And that's why I personally have never been more excited about the future for developers. Going back to Google Cloud, we built it for developers. Uh, and because we're really inspired by what you've all uh, done with it and what you're doing with it. And our job is to make it easier for you to do what you love and do it faster. So we focus on making it uh, uh, easier to make you more productive, achieve your goals with the least effort. And we're always taking the feedback that you're sharing with us to really build a cloud form that just works, uh, whether that's by natively embedding uh, security uh, or sustainability features into Google Cloud, or featuring partner solutions directly in our Cloud Console, uh, we're really focusing on one goal. And that goal is to give you the best developer experience of any cloud provider. 
Now, here's just a few examples of the speed you'll get on Google Cloud. For example, deploying a containerized application with GKE Autopilot is up to 2.6 times faster than with the competition. And thanks to Cloud Deploy, DevOps tasks like continuous delivery are up to 2.4 times faster than the competition. And with Cloud Run, developers can deploy and execute server loss jobs 50% faster than the nearest competition. But we are not just making development faster. We're also making it easier to develop securely. And this week, we released Software Delivery Shield, which provides a fully managed security uh, across your entire uh, software supply chain. So from the IDE to CI-CD pipelines to runtime, we're making it easy to secure your organizations and, employ, and, and, and enforce its security policy uh, consistently so that you can stay focused on developing your code without having to worry about security vulnerabilities. And, and there's some really cool features underneath the software delivery shield. Uh, let's start with cloud workstations now in public preview. And instead of just being another uh, desktop IDE, cloud workstations provides a secure developer environment for remote developers who are working with sensitive data. Uh, it comes with pre-configured developer environments, along with support for multiple uh, IDEs like IntelliJ, uh, PyCharm, uh, Writer, and so on. And when it comes to security, it has built-in integrations with VPC service controls and can reduce any data or code exfiltration risks. Also, any vulnerabilities, uh, licensing violations, uh, unsafe code patterns are highlighted as soon as you write the code. And to further help you secure, secure the software uh, supply chain, we also have our Azure open source service, uh, now also in public preview. So this service curates open source packages and makes them available to cloud customers. Uh, but we scan and analyze and fuzz test over 250 key uh, Java and, and Python packages for security vulnerabilities on your behalf, giving you the assurance and peace of mind that your software supply chain is supported with the same level of security that Google itself uh, uses in its own environment. And a third new security uh, uh, feature for developers is in uh, Cloud Build. Um, this is our service that lets you build and deploy across multiple environments from uh, VMs or, or Kubernetes or Firebase. And it now offers Salsa Level 3 compliance by default. Uh, what do I mean by that? So Salsa is a new security framework that gives uh, you confidence that your binaries can be securely tracked back to the source to prevent tampering uh, and prevent specific classes of threats like cross-built uh, contamination. And then finally, both GKE and Cloud Run uh, now come with an uh, opinionated set of guidelines uh, to help you improve your security posture at runtime. So with GKE, you find a new a security management dashboard that helps you improve the security posture of your GKE clusters and containerized uh, workloads. So you get uh, detailed assessments, actionable remediation advice, and insights. And Cloud Run also comes with a similar dashboard where you can see information about the, the salsa level of your running images, about build provenance, or any vulnerability that you have in your running services. Uh, now, seeing is believing. So please welcome the awesome Priyanka Vergadia to the stage. And she will show you how all of this comes together. Uh, Priyanka, please uh, take it away. Thank you, Ars. Hi, everyone. 
I am really excited to be part of Next 22. I'm sure you are too, are you? Yay! Great, so today, let me introduce you to Symbol X, a fictional e-commerce company that's running on Google Cloud. They have embraced all those modern practices and Google Cloud services to allow them to easily innovate in their space while remaining highly secure. Well, here is what their current system looks like. And it's a set of microservices that run in GKE, protected by our overall solution that we call, you just heard this, Software Delivery Shield. Now, if we take a look at the console, these, there are some services. I'll show you how they are deployed and how they, as soon as I can get into my computer. There we go. OK, so I've created this Symbol X demo inside a project. So when you go into the workload, you can see the services that we were seeing earlier on the, on the screen. These are those services that we've deployed. And then if you click on the security posture, um, the security issues, the vulnerabilities, and the configuration concerns uh, can be scanned directly. And if I click on the vulnerability concerns, um, you can uh, filter it by the cluster that we were seeing, or if you have more clusters, the criticality. And if I click on workloads here, I should be able to see some services. Um, for example, the payment service here allows for privileged escalations. With Kubernetes pod security spec standards, if you're familiar, this is discouraged. So while these are, there are some valid use cases for having a configuration like this, let's say our team did this unintentionally, and we can now, with the security posture analysis here, we can go into the recommended actions and lock this down. Now, while the current site has been operating this way with ongoing protections and the business actually, in this case, doesn't stop evolving, right? So let's say Symbol, um, we want to grow our business into other markets. And Florida is one of those regions where we are expanding. So we decided to create a new brand presence. So we want a newer version of our front end service because our Florida team is also new to the company and lacks some of that Kubernetes experience. We want to onboard them quickly. So we'll set them up to use cloud workstations that you just heard about to write code while deploying to Cloud Run. Now, Cloud Workstations provides a fully managed development machine that's running in the cloud. And Cloud Run allows us to deploy a new brand front end without redeploying the entire application stack into each of the regions if we end up expanding to even further regions. So we want to develop this quickly, but also move it safely from our local workstations and through development staging and those production environments to be sure that we release whatever we release is both secure as well as bug free. Now, let's see how we actually do that with cloud workstations. Now, the global core team has already configured our workstation, which allows the entire Florida development team to get started quickly. This is what you're seeing as the, in the, inside the workstation. And if I launch it, which I've already done um, for us today, so if I launch it, you see the, the workstation that opens up. It has stopped for me, so maybe I'll launch it again here. So I'll go back, I'll launch the workstation. This may take a second or two. So as soon as that comes up, I'll actually bring my link up here for the workstation, because I have it already set up in a way that um, that's defined for me. This is the beauty of uh, workstation. You can set it up so um, it, when you just saw that it was showing me um, how to configure my workstation. I've already done it here. So now what you're seeing on the left-hand side um, here is a panel where I can check out my code. I checked it out already. And then I have a few files open where I was um, developing. Now, uh, as we get started, I can click on the cloud code here and run my 
um, emulator, which is where I will do my development. Now, the great news with cloud workstations is that um, it comes with network security. Um, and it's much easier to in workstations because you're running inside your own VPC, and it supports VPC service controls and private, private ingress and egress, which avoids you to deal with any code exfiltration risks. So you can see here, I've opened up the services.environment file for us to see. Um, and here I'm using private IP addresses of the backend service in the staging environment. Um, any, and also inside the uh, development environment, the development loop is faster because I'm using a built-in Cloud Run emulator that I was just showing you. So if I click on this, I run the Cloud Run emulator, um, and it pops up with um, the forwarding port. Um, and it's going to take a second here for us to say a few yeses um, to get it to get it to launch. And once it does launch, we'll see a local host and a forwarding port, which is where we'll be able to look at our front end in our local workstation environment. So right here, I'll click on this link, follow the link, and it should open up the development environment. Now, um, let's say I want to make some changes to this site, and I'm not going to um, be a risk taker here and just make some very tiny changes. Let's say I just change the name of, the, uh, of our site here and push these, uh, these updates to our Git repository. This should, in my development environment, update quickly so that I can see some of those that's still happening, but I should be able to see some of those changes that I just made, let it go through. OK. Um, and here we go. We should be able to refresh and see new products. Yay! OK. Great. That part of the demo is over. <laughs> um, and then uh, from here, uh, we just saw the cloud build parts of it, right? We commit those messages and we see the changes and then in the development environment. With the focus on end-to-end -end security, we take the integrity of the builds at Symbol super seriously, right? So that is why we're using cloud build to achieve the Salsa level three assurances for the images that we are building. And here on the screen, you can see the image that was just built and um, on the right-hand side, if I view the details of that image, I can see the Salsa Level 3 uh, assurance. And then the cloud build also provides the signed build provenance and dependency. So you can see the dependencies and the provenance here. And the provenance really pinpoints the recipes that are used to make the image, while if I click on the dependencies, they are the ingredients. So taken together, this metadata helps establish the credibility of the image while providing a detailed listing of what's happening inside. Now, during that build process, the images were stored in Artifact Registry, uh, which provides that automated on-push vulnerability scanning. Now, reviewing these vulnerability scans, if I scroll up and down here, you can see that uh, there's no critical or high vulnerability. So we can feel comfortable in promoting this image into our staging environment. OK, so I'll get into our deployment pipeline here. So here we can see the continuous delivery pipeline um, that, OK, uh, I need to click on this to show you the pipeline. OK, so here you can see this continuous delivery uh, pipeline uh, that we are using Cloud Deploy for. Uh, with each of the pushes that we made from the GitHub repository, we automatically roll out those latest builds to our development environment. This is where, where that was being pushed when I was showing that change being made and pushed. Now, here you can also see your rollouts and your release targets. Where are you pushing them? Um, and then since the container security scans that we reviewed earlier were showing that there are no vulnerabilities, I can very comfortably uh, promote the development uh, build here into our staging environment. So let's do that right here. And then um, for at this point, we can let it, let it go through. And I'll want to show you something else. So um, when this, during the staging environment 
we, we don't want it to push something from staging to production, right? That would be a bad idea without doing more tests. So we would run some integration and load tests in the release for, the, for the release readiness. So from these tests, we've um, you know, fabricated some errors here. From these tests, you can, we can see that there was a point in time where we started to see a large number of 500 errors in our checkout service. But our checkout service logs are definitely showing that there's something wrong, so we should be investigating further. And because our platform is distributed set of microservices, we do really need to make sure we dig deeper before we push something from, from staging to production. And the, here in our uh, log explorer also, we can see something's wrong with that checkout service. Um, but I want to dig even deeper, right? With log analytics, which is a new feature in cloud logging, I have the full power of SQL queries for my logs that's powered by BigQuery under the hood. So it's now fast, even if you have larger volumes of, of log and that you are analyzing. And what I can do is I can explore those correlations across some of our user journeys, the testings around simulated shopping sessions, and then I can join and group those logs between the front end and the shopping cart service and the checkout service, which is what I'm doing here in, in some of these um, SQL statements. Turns out that's problematic. Um, error part was actually a product ID. That was the one that we were releasing in new markets. Some of its pricing and shipping data was malformed. So this is actually a data error and a place that where we can do a better job at logging the card service itself a little bit better. Given that this error wasn't really pro coming from our code from our front end, we can feel comfortable to push that release that we were talking about into production. Now, luckily, OK, so this part failed because I was, um, I, I might have, uh, should have given a different name to our, um, to our release. Um, so maybe we'll go to our backup video that I had set up where we can use the, where we can show this last bit of the production release. Or I can roll it back and go to our previous release. But if we can roll the video, I think that might do the trick here. And we get to the last part. And I just want to show the part where we go through some approval. So when we push our release from staging to production, can we switch to the video, please? And we go from staging to production. Um, that's when you'll be able to see um, that there, it requires a few approvals. Um, now, I had a few, the few of those approvals, and then I can push um, that to production. Now you're seeing that on screen. Once you push it into production, you see the live updates that you were seeing in, um, in the development environment that we had made. Um, so with that in mind, uh, on an ongoing basis, we can keep tabs on our, um, you're seeing uh, it's running a little behind. So you would go through pending, and then you'll click on that review. And once you go through that, that should launch and review um, are built into production. And once that goes through, we actually see our live um, updates, also from the cloud deploy, but, uh, but also from um, clicking on that build. And we'll see that's, that's where it is. Cool. Now, on an ongoing basis, we can keep the tabs on Salsa status of our uh, security uh, services directly in the context of the cloud run security. So um, you're seeing on screen there, um, the security tab shows you the Salsa status. Now, throughout, um, you've seen how Symbol has been able to really balance the ease of development and productivity with security, resulting in the successful delivery of new opportunity for the business. With that, let me hand it back to Urs. Thank you. Thank you, Priyanka. Um, so what you all saw 
was how easy it is to write, deploy, and run your code you know, faster and easier, all while making it much more secure. But uh, you know, coding is one thing, but data is just as important. As applications become more interactive, full of personalization, with intelligence built in, it's critical to make sense of both structured and unstructured data. And we are building the best data and AI capabilities in the industry to help your company reduce your costs and turn you into a data hero. So we help you transform your data into valuable insights with this unified data cloud. We help you break down data silos across data lakes and warehouses by giving a, you a common governance model and data management system with Big Lake and Dataplex. And we also provide one of the most extensive open data clouds and supporting ecosystems in the industry. So we help establish open standards and that the open source community can continue to evolve to maximize your flexibility uh, in the cloud, because that lets you develop and run where you need to be with the best of open source, uh, uh, including Spark integration with BigQuery. Or you could also modernize your application and databases uh, by moving it to enhanced Postgres uh, on AlloyDB. And of course, we wouldn't be truly open without the strength of our data cloud partners. They offer the most integrated and, and high fidelity uh, integration with Google Cloud. So you can build this breakthrough application with a wide variety of services and solutions. Now, what sets Google Cloud apart is that we bring the power of Google AI to your business data to help make your applications more intelligent. Uh, we help you ask questions of your data with integrations across Looker, Data Studio, BigQuery, uh, Google Workspace, all together with built-in AI. New services like uh, Vertex AI Vision give you an end-to-end -end application development environment that lets you process video streams at scale while respecting the privacy of individuals. Or our new translation hub lowers uh, the cost of translation for your business. It translates content in 135 languages, including many spoken in India, helping uh, it to make it much easier for your human reviewers to validate translation recommendations. Uh, so all of these services can make it easier for you to build more powerful data-driven apps and become that data hero in your company. And to show you how this all works, let's head back over to Priyanka and see how SymbolX is using these new data cloud capabilities. Uh, Priyanka. Back again. Cool. So we'll still stick with SymbolX here. Let's say SymbolX ingests a number of different photos, image stocks, and visual components that are sources of uh, sources that you know people share on their application physically and in their stores now it's important that symbolx analyzes all these images for privacy and removes any of the images that contain sensitive information before they are used so symbols analysts can now connect to those images using big lake object tables to access binary data, then create the machine learning models using Vision AI and BigQuery, and then deploy those models to Vertex AI endpoints for consumption in transactional databases like AlloyDB. So let me show you all of this. We create a connection inside SymbolX um, project. So I'm going to walk into our project here. Um, this is the cloud storage bucket where all those images have already been ingested. And then when we go into our BigQuery, this is where uh, Big Lake 
um, is. So we've created a connection from that cloud storage bucket into BigQuery using those external connections that Big Lake offers. Now, once that connection is established, then we've created a few queries. And I'll walk you through what's happening here. So we've created an external table of those raw images. And then we query those images to get information about, about them. So it's the metadata of those images. Now, here we are seeing the URL generated, the uh, MP5 hash of those images. So basically, all the images that you have in, in our cloud storage bucket uh, you have the metadata for that drawn and extracted now. What you can also do after that extraction is we've taken that and provided with this query right here, we're analyzing using the Vision AI. And the way we do that is we're using Cloud Functions and, and SQL, and we create a function that analyzes the images using Vision AI in a single SQL command. This is what that command is doing. Um, it's talking to the Cloud Functions and getting us the um, analysis from the Vision AI back. Now, Vision AI classifies the images based on um, the information that they contain. And it could include personally identifiable information, including non-safe content, faces of people, logos, texts that can be further scanned for additional identifiers. So here you're seeing in this result, I can make this a little bit bigger. You're seeing um, all the information about those images highlighted here. Now, we can definitely improve on what this information is. We can create our own models now in a single step. So beyond this, once I have this information, now I have additional table and additional information on those images. Now I can use that information and combine it with other data and create a model uh, which is custom in nature using Vertex AI. And that model gets registered for deployment. This is that command where we are registering the model with our uh, Vertex AI. Now, once that model is deployed, it will uh, be created as an endpoint in Vertex AI, which I'll show you in just a second. But once that um, endpoint is created, you can start predicting using that endpoint. So if I look at, um, I have created, yeah, here's that query. So I'm testing by just predicting using that model. And the response that I get back is the feature vectors that were being utilized. So if I go into my endpoints, this is that endpoint that's created in Vertex AI that allows us to um, serve that model results in real time and includes the components that the customer um, really wants us to use. And uh, this could be things like instances of shirts that they, might be, um, that, that they might be using, or shirts for running, or shoes for basketball, things like that. So bringing these capabilities together it really unifies the, the structured data and the unstructured data um, in the cloud by harnessing this AI power to make products that are become more searchable for customers such as Symbol Retail. With that, thank you. I'll bring back Urs. All right. Thank you, Priyanka, for showing us a few, just a few, of the great new services uh, coming out of Google Cloud. So um, I hope you realized that, or you've seen that the investments that we're making in Google Cloud really start with a developer-first mindset to make it easier for you to build faster apps and services and really push the boundaries and exceed your users' expectations. Uh, if you'd like to keep up to date with everything that's going on in cloud, uh, please join our developer program, Google Cloud Innovators. Uh, you'll get the latest news and are, become part of an inclusive uh, technical community that really encourages you to learn and grow. And also remember to check out the new data and AI learning challenges, my favorite, that we've built around the Drone Racing League. So you get to put these services into action through a fun, immersive learning experience where you'll get hands-on with race data, predict race outcomes, and provide tips to pilots to enhance their season performance. And you even get to compete for a chance to win a trip to the season final, finale of the league's world championship. So this is going to be fun. Now, 
Uh, join us for our Hive at Next event, featuring some of our champion innovators, uh, Google Cloud engineers, and advocates, and also our amazing partners, of course. And speaking of amazing, please welcome back to the stage Priyanka and enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you. All right. So now we move on to the next section. So a decade ago, there was no such role as cloud operations engineer or a DevOps specialist. But when you fast forward to today, we have exciting job functions like cloud cost optimization engineer, or a hybrid network engineer, or a multi-cloud specialist, and even more such terms. So as cloud computing continues to evolve, so are these job functions. Now, to build an exciting and sustaining career in cloud, it's really essential to understand where the cloud is headed and what roles will emerge in the future. So in the next few minutes, let's discuss what's next for the cloud and the roles that will evolve along with it. But in order to get to the future, we really do have to start with the present. So how do you actually build a career in cloud? That's where we'll start. And then we'll dive into how do you build a sustainable career in cloud? And then we'll circle back to our main question, which is what jobs and roles will the cloud create in next decade? So the key takeaways from Urza's talk earlier and other things that you are going to see throughout next are really around those major categories, the infrastructure, the network, the application development, the security, the operations, data, machine learning, automation. It's all around those, right? Now, the question that comes up in the developer community quite often is how do you build a career in this, these areas in cloud? Well, the answer really depends on where you are in your career. So you have to ask that question to yourself. No matter where you are, a bit of coding is definitely non-negotiable for a career in cloud. So I would start there. Next is really understanding the internet fundamentals. How does the internet work? What happens when you type a URL in the browser? Do you know all of those steps? How do servers establish connections? How does DNS work? How do you get the IP address for a host name? How do databases work? What are the different types of databases? When do you use which one? This broad understanding really helps you get the good lay of the land of where you fall in your learnings and where you would like to go further. Now comes your path, understanding your path. Which path do you want to take? Now, there's a lot to choose from, like all the lists that I had mentioned earlier. This is where you really rely on a bit of your past work experience and your background. So let's take a few examples here. I'll talk about a few different example personas. Consider Nina here, who has been a database administrator for years and is now looking to move to cloud. Now, she should start with a database engineer path and she could start from what she already knows, which is deploying a database in, let's say, Compute Engine instance, then automating that deployment with Terraform or infrastructure as code, and then trying to deploy the same thing using a cloud database such as Cloud SQL. That's Nina's path to get started. Consider another example. Let's say Rina who has been an application developer and is now looking to move to cloud. Now, she could start with building an application and deploying it on Compute Engine again. And then the next step could be learning the containerization aspect. So containerize that app and deploy it with GKE. Then the next step further would be to containerize it and deploy it with serverless cloud run. Now, once that is deployed, you can, she can start exploring um, secure build process, cloud build, cloud deploy, things we just saw. And that kind of gets into that whole application development um, phase or uh, if you are at that stage. Now, the third example, let's consider Shiv, who has 
no background in any of these paths, but still wants to get into cloud. Now, how should he go about making his own path? Well, in situations like this, when you have no background in cloud, the path that I recommend is pursuing associate level cloud architect knowledge. And because I'm not saying go get a certification, I'm just saying pursuing that knowledge because it prepares you with a little bit of everything from all the things that we talked about, the infrastructure, the networking, the security, the data, and more, which makes it a great foundational step. And from there, you can pick a specialization and stick, or you can just continue to stick with it and be an architect. Studying for a certification also really helps. You don't really have to get certified, but obviously there are benefits to doing that. But if you're like me, just having a structured study plan helps you gain those skills faster and gives you that hands-on experience with the labs. Then you're off to applying all of that knowledge into your own projects. And from here, the other big question that we get asked from developers a lot is, how do I show to a hiring manager that I have the experience that, that's needed in order to fit in the role? Now, within your current company or team, work with people who are with similar interests uh, or on projects that um, have those opportunities that you are interested in um, branching into in cloud. Now, volunteer and share um, that you're interested in helping or collaborating. That's a great way to gain skills that can open up future opportunities within your own company and help you build your resume. Now, if you don't have opportunities within your company, then the best way to approach it is to work on your own hands-on projects. Pick a project, pick whatever you're interested in and build it out. Pick a project that spans across all of those programming, networking, Linux basic skills, and uh, deploying whatever you build into the cloud. So an example project could be building an API or a web application. Now, it would require you to develop that code for the application, so you're learning how to code if you don't already know that. Um, you would also be needing to pick up the infrastructure to deploy that application in and then pick up storage and database options and choose um, how to connect them. And in this process, you'd basically end up learning what I said in the beginning, the fundamentals of the internet, how it works, how you deploy things in cloud. And this is essentially building your portfolio. So you can share what you have built now on GitHub, on LinkedIn. And that's where you really get noticed by the hiring managers. Now, as you envision the application to build, you need to represent your vision in the architecture form. Earlier this year, if you remember, we have launched an architecture diagramming tool to make it easy for you to share your vision with others. Today, I am so glad to announce that we are bringing some of the really cool updates to the architecture diagramming tool. Now, as you drag and drop things on the canvas, we are generating Terraform script for each component behind the scenes so you can easily deploy those architectures directly into Google Cloud projects. Yay. It's going to come out soon. Uh, watch out for a blog announcement when that comes out. Now that we know how to get into cloud from various experiences and experience levels, how do you build a sustainable career in cloud so you grow and grow beyond where you are today? Now this brings us to another question. What jobs and roles will cloud create in the next decade so you can grow into them? To answer this question and more, let me invite Janaki Ram MSV, also known as Johnny in the Cloud Community. He's a principal analyst at Janaki Ram and Associates. <laughs> Hi. Welcome, Johnny. It's uh, incredibly exciting to be a part of the in person event. It's amazing to have you, and we're very, very excited to have you. So Johnny, for those who don't know, have, has worked for two hyperscalers and advises companies on using cloud efficiently. I'm sure you are on the edge of your seats to hear all his advice and how to build a sustainable career in cloud. 
to start off, what will define the next generation of cloud computing, Jani? Absolutely. But uh, before we get to what's next, let's take a snapshot of where the cloud is today. So today's cloud has building blocks in the form of compute, storage, and network. And on top of that, we have layers like databases, application platform services, and so on. Yeah. Today, most of the job functions are focused on exploiting these capabilities, modernizing applications, migrating workloads, and managing them to get the best out of the cloud. But once this stabilizes and once cloud becomes the norm, we are going to see the evolution of the next generation of cloud. So there are basically four pillars that I foresee uh, which will define the next gen cloud. The first one is modern compute. Yeah. So today's compute is defined by VMs and virtualization. But the future of compute is all about containers, Kubernetes, and serverless. Uh, you won't write applications that are large. You will build applications that are highly composable, highly event-driven, and completely decoupled and autonomous. And they all work together and get orchestrated to deliver what you need as the functionality. So the future of compute is driven by serverless, containers, and Kubernetes. That's one of the key pillars. The second key pillar that we already see is the polyglot database. Okay. So today's database is categorized into NoSQL, relational database, graph database, document database, columnar database, and so on. But what is interesting is the database engine is going to be the same, and it spans the entire globe. It's almost like planet scale. And on top of this engine, you have protocols that expose MongoDB functionality, PostgreSQL functionality, MySQL, SQL Server, and so on. Yeah. So the engine remains the same, but it speaks multiple protocols. Yeah. That fundamentally changes the way we look at databases. And that is the second pillar, the polyglot databases. The third one is the most obvious, that is AI and ML. Yeah. So AI and ML is going to significantly impact all of us and the cloud. First, it is going to change the way infrastructure is delivered by bringing in a lot of predictive analytics and predictive operations that will make cloud more economical and efficient. But not only that, it opens up new opportunities. For example, a set of data scientists who need a Spark cluster uh, to set up on Kubernetes, yep. someone needs to do that. Yep. So defining that infrastructure for data prep for training and experimentation, for deployment and inference, and ensuring uptime of all these layers yeah. is the next generation task. And it is driven by AI and ML. And finally, the fourth one, which is written on the wall, yeah. is multi-cloud and hybrid cloud. Yeah. Uh, some call it super cloud, which is the consolidation, the aggregation of multiple clouds. So today, we focus and specialize and get certified in one cloud. But the future is you consume object storage from one cloud, analytics from the other, containers from someone else, and you build uh, an application that spans multiple clouds. Yeah. And that is a super cloud, multi-cloud architecture. And eventually, it also gets extended to data center, where your backbone applications like SAP, PeopleSoft, and other line of business applications continue to stay within the data center, but uh, the compute moves closer to the data, and that is the hybrid cloud. And uh, again, uh, examples like Anthos, Azure Arc, all of them are examples uh, where Kubernetes is driving multi-cloud and hybrid cloud. So to summarize, the four new themes and the four new pillars of the cloud are uh, basically the modern compute, yeah. polyglot databases, AI and ML, followed by multi-cloud and hybrid cloud. So that was very insightful. Can we switch to the slide with the four pillars, please? Uh, so that was very insightful. Um, the thing that I want to add here is in all of those areas, um, we've been working super hard to, um, to, to help either bridge the skill gap 
or to provide tools that make those jobs easier. So for example, in the multi and hybrid cloud category, uh, we launched Anthos a few years ago, which helps you um, analyze and do the management of those um, workloads that are across clouds and on premises. And when it comes to AI and ML, um, we launched Vertex AI last year, where um, if you have used it, if you're new to machine learning, it gives you tools to uh, get started and bridge that gap um, of, of the skills that you might have. And then if you are an advanced data scientist or a machine learning expert, you have the tools to build those pipelines and scale your production machine learning deployments. Um, and the third one here with the polyglot databases, because we just recently announced Alloy DB, which is sort of that combination of uh, transactional database and um, you know, analytics processing sort of combined together uh, for use cases that need that. Um, so we, uh, those are some of the announcements that I kind of wanted to complement. And then the bottom layer there with security and DevOps, we all saw the demo and um, the, the new announcements today for workstation, cloud workstations, and also secure um, uh, security shields. So um, with that in mind, I want to come back to you and um, can you walk us through maybe a few evolutions that you can uh, see cloud evolving into? Absolutely. You know, just a decade ago, uh, we have seen how system administrators, network administrators, storage administrators transform and transition to cloud ops and DevSecOps. Uh, today, no one has a, a title that says systems administrator. Yeah. You know, they call themselves as DevOps engineer. But from DevOps, where do we go next? And how does this title or the job function evolve and branches out in the future? Well, just like systems administration has matured and graduated to cloud ops plus DevOps, we are going to see DevOps branching out into multiple uh, uh, functions aligned with the core pillars of the forward-looking cloud. So the first one is DevOps will branch out into cloud-native ops. So cloud-native ops is all about how do you provision Kubernetes clusters? How do you ensure the image registries are secure? How do you basically maintain the supply chain security aspect of it? And how do you secure workloads and runtimes of your cluster infrastructure? But Kubernetes is not confined just to the cloud. Kubernetes is making its way to hybrid and then even to the edge. So from DevOps, we'll see specialists who are focused on edge native operations. Yeah. You know, those edge devices powered by Kubernetes and containers will run in aircrafts, uh, in ships and vessels, in even trains and automotive uh, vehicles. So edge is going to be everywhere. Yeah, you know, I just did a video on this. If uh, anyone happened to catch it, it was on Abe's Burger, which is the food um, fast service, quick service restaurant. And we took that as an example where it's like if you have got multiple locations, imagine hospitals or retailers who've got multiple locations, they have to do some processing at the edge at those locations. And there has to be compute there. There have to be deployments there where you're using Anthos. There'll also be machine learning at the edge. So you're doing operations for that. So those would be the roles there would Absolutely. Be. That Burger Shop video was fascinating. Thank you. You. It's very real world. Uh, it, it, it actually conveys what the challenges are for a real world customer. So DevOps to cloud native ops, edge native ops, and then when it comes to ML and AI, we are going to see data ops, yeah. model ops, and the overarching ML ops as a theme. And uh, that is the next lucrative opportunity for a lot of DevOps engineers because the future is all about ML and AI. And the data scientists and ML researchers need someone to take care of the infrastructure and maintain it for them. So uh, branching out from DevOps into ML ops, and uh, within that, focusing on data ops, model ops, and uh, the entire ML ops uh, spectrum is very exciting. Uh, and uh, coming to the uh, last pillar of multi-cloud and hybrid cloud, today we see cloud solution architects. Uh, they are very good at defining VPCs, 
firewall groups, network security, and optimizing for cost, performance, reliability, and scale. But the future is all about how do you expand that across multiple clouds? So we are going to see multi-cloud architects uh, where you pick best of the breed services, not from just one cloud provider, but a plethora of clouds and cloud providers, and you assemble best of the breed solution that is economical, scalable, reliable, and secure. Yeah. Very fascinating. And same thing with a hybrid cloud specialist who can bridge the gap between the data center and the public cloud. Yeah. So if you are transitioning to DevOps, or if you have already stabilized your career in DevOps, the next decade is going to be very exciting for you as you transition and take up one of these routes uh, to build a highly sustainable, highly secure career. Yeah, and then the rise of event-driven applications, the microservices, we saw that in the demo as well, and serverless, all of that is also um, feeds into the whole Kubernetes and containerization um, landscape that, that you should continue to evolve your skills into that, that area as well. So um, I want to switch it back to you for containers and Kubernetes, just a uh, few seconds maybe. What I consider those to be critical skills as, we, as anybody evolves in cloud. Um, what do you think? Absolutely. Uh, you know, just like there are dedicated Linux administrators yeah. who master hardening the operating system, user management, integration, and so on, think of Kubernetes as the new Linux. Yeah. Uh, managing a production cluster is much more complex than managing a set of Linux machines. So investing in Kubernetes is really critical because that is the new operating system for the cloud, for the edge and for the data center. So if you are a Linux administrator or a Linux DevOps engineer, it's time for you to consider Kubernetes and invest in that. That is the future, and that's where the entire industry is headed. Amazing. OK, well, you got the memo. <laughs> <laughs> well, if there was one thing that you would like our audience to take away today, what would you leave them with? I spelt it multiple times, and I'll do it one more time. To ensure your career, make sure you are learning, investing, and mastering Kubernetes. So the, the single takeaway and call to action for you is Kubernetes, Kubernetes, and Kubernetes. That's what is going to rule the infrastructure world. Great. Well, as cloud is evolving, we saw that the roles in cloud will also evolve with this evolution of the technology. Now, staying current on these trends will be how we make our careers sustainable in cloud. So follow what Johnny just said and learn Kubernetes. And now for our technical panel discussion, please welcome Director of Customer Engineering, Google Cloud India, Subram Natarajan. Good morning. Warm welcome to Hive at Next 2022. Indeed, a great pleasure to see you all here. If there is one universal phenomenon that stands out in this pandemic, it is the emergence of creative capabilities of individuals and organizations. The need for innovation is not new, but it has become the key differentiator between the just surviving and successful. When you want to think of innovating at scale, India is a fertile ground. Just think about this. In a country of billion plus, with 1,500 language variants, 10% of them speak English. So how do you democratize the access of information to this vast population? While cloud technology has immensely helped in building, nurturing, and creating new platforms and frameworks and communities, we should keep in mind that all of this happened with interesting times that is in front of us. The first of the challenge is the dynamic environment that we all live in. It is about the changing regulatory requirements that face our organizations. The governing bodies specify requirements that we all have to comply with. For several organizations, it is 
very common to see the self-governance measures becoming the nuances of the requirements that they specify. However, these requirements have given rise to so many new innovation, such as the case of KYC digitization. Or even in the case of creating frameworks, you might have seen how the penetration of UPI has revolutionized the entire digital commerce. Newer technologies often create new opportunities, create new business models, contributing to both top line as well as bottom line for organizations. More importantly, these serve as launch pads for differentiating themselves on the value proposition platform. They build loyalty, they build brand, and immensely grow along with it. Think about emerging technologies like AR, VR. It has the potential to offer superior customer experience. Or in the case of Web3, the emergence of use cases changes the way content gets created, information gets created, the ownership, syndication, and so on. Blockchain in itself has potential to change or revolutionize the way transactions are being conducted today. Successful innovation found their way into large-scale adoption at the back of skills. And skills availability has become extremely critical now. In order to take advantage of the enormous market opportunities that these new technologies present, we need to complement them with the right kind of skills. So skill building is an important aspect of every innovation program. On that note, let's watch this video clip where all of what I just talked about gets highlighted. Let's roll this video. All right, more than what we saw in this video, it's always good to hear from customers who have gone through this, who underwent all the transformation that we, uh, that we hear about. Today, we have two of our valued customers with us joining the technical panel. Please join me in welcoming Gaurav Bhatia Thank you. from ShareChat. Thank you. Prasad Hebar from HDFC Bank. We also have Venkat Varadarajan from Intel, our longtime partners, and venture capitalist firm Lightspeed, represented by Hemant Mohapatra. I'm sure we are all going to learn a lot from the wisdom from these gentlemen here. Let's get right into this. I'm going to ask you a question, and I'm going to take, you know, request you to take turns to answer this question. What would be the one word you would use to describe the state of the innovation in the country and why? I'm going to begin, you, begin with you, Goro. Sure. So um, one word, if I, you know, I would say rising. Uh, and if I may take two words, I would say rising and shining. Um, and I say this because uh, you know, innovation requires a lot of different things to be in place for it to be successful. Um, I've heard of it being referred to as the three Ts. So there is, of course, you know, the uh, target market, there is the talent, and there is the technology platform. Um, on the target market, I think it's quite remarkable how um, you know, companies based out of India are now building for the global market, whether it's SaaS apps, whether it's developer tools. And what that has done is uh, forced a lot of diverse set of use cases, a lot of new product requirements, and a lot of new scenarios to come and new challenges to solve for. So that has really pushed the pace of innovation and um, the, the requirements around how things are being done. Uh, the second is the talent aspect. Um, you know, India has always had a very strong talent pool. 
but now more so because of the remote work culture and the mindset shift, there's a lot that we can tap into. I mean, we at ShareChat, for instance, are completely location agnostic. We've got engineers throughout the country, and not just throughout the country, across the globe. Uh, so we're finding the right talent across the globe to solve the challenging problems we have. Um, so that's on the talent part. And last but not the least, and I feel most important and pertinent for the audience here, um, is also the technology. Right? The kind of innovation that we're talking about, you know, rapidly developing stuff, launching it, measuring it, doing iterations, doing A-B testing, um, just cannot be done um, you know, if you don't have the technology foundations and underpinnings in place. Um, you know, so, for instance, um, last year, my son who's in 11th grade, um, you know, he built a pneumonia prediction model um, where he took 3,000 chest x-rays um, off the internet and then trained an ML model um, you know, without uh, writing much code, less than 100 lines of Python code, and you know, just clicking through Google Auto ML. And he got amazing results, and this was for a school project. And I think that kind of fundamentally changes how software is built and developed today, because you know, a young entrepreneur um, in a tier two town in India has access to the same technology infrastructure, you know, the same found, you know, the same databases, the same messaging queues, the same caching servers, uh, the same compute that a $20 billion company in the Valley would have. And sometimes even better because many companies may be bogged down with legacy infrastructure. Um, so I feel, you know, uh, much is being said about this being the decade for India, and it's you know really exciting to be part of it and seeing it unfold. Super, uh, super. So rising and shining. Yeah, innovation at such a young age, fascinating. Prasad, what are your yeah? What so are first your thoughts? Off, very good morning to all of you all. I think it's uh, it feels wonderful uh, to be here. So if you ask me one word for where in how I would characterize India's innovation, since I'm in Bangalore, I would say Saka thought maga. <laughs> So, so I, I do sincerely believe that uh, we are world beating. I mean, you pick up uh, you know, any publication, you will find Bangalore in top three, uh, in Asia Pacific, India in you know, top 20, and, and so on. Uh, so, uh, so clearly, I do believe that you know, our, our time has come. A lot of factors have come together to uh, make this happen. But why do I believe that uh, we are where we are today? So four reasons, Gaurav spoke about uh, talent. I think it's all of y'all, right? It is, we have reached critical mass in terms of talent. Uh, to build a world-class product, you need engineers, but you also need UI UX designers, you also need good documentation, you need you know, DevOps, you need the entire spectrum. And Urs mentioned 27% of you know, cloud engineers are from India, right? The rate of learning is, is 7x. So I do believe talent, we have the critical mass today to build world-class products, so that is the, uh, the first reason. Second reason, again, Gaurav mentioned, is the size of the market. I mean, we are so huge. Uh, we are pretty much, if you look at our urban market, the size of the US, right? About 300 million uh, people in urban India. And I think it was yesterday or day before, uh, there was a Bain report which said that in two years, the number of e-commerce users in India is going to catch up with the US, right? I mean, who thought? you know, five, seven years back, that's going to happen. So we have a huge market, and this is only urban. I'm not even talking about rural, right? So we have a huge market. We also have unique problems to solve, right? So there is language. Imagine if you had to open an account for your maid servant, your driver, right? You had to enable credit for them. You had to give them loans. So these are very specific India-based problems which the smart talent can really go behind. So I think that really is the third reason. And coming to finance, I think the fourth reason is we've done a really good job, and I say we, I think, the, the regulatory mechanism of creating the canvas, right, in terms of UPI, in terms of open credit enablement, in terms of uh, ONDC, right, in terms of account aggregation framework. So there's a bunch of platform or ecosystem level things which have been created to the, for all of us to innovate, right? So that becomes the canvas. So I think these are some of the reasons, and I, I truly believe that uh, you know, India has, has come of age with, with respect to innovation. Oh, interesting, interesting, very good. Uh, Venkat, what's, her, what's your thought? Yeah, one word, uh, Shubram, I would say it's accelerating, as I see and uh, talk to customers across various segments. No part of 
the economy is left behind, starting from agriculture to manufacturing um, to banking. Every part of the economy um, is finding new ways to improve efficiencies using technology, whether it is uh, the storage of agricultural product, how to improve the supply chain, or using artificial intelligence for accelerating some of the banking, KYC, et cetera, right? So every part of the economy is seeing innovation getting accelerated, and it's going to get even better with the advent of 5G. With 5G, you will see more and more use cases coming up across, across the B2C space and also across um, the manufacturing and smart edge kind of applications. Thank you. Thank you. Hemant, one word that top of mind. Yeah, so it's hard to go last on this question, but uh, I'll do my best. I think, so as a VC, what we see is the emerging parts of the ecosystem more often than not, and we see it earlier than most people do. And what has been remarkable for me is ambition. That word is important for VCs because we do care about highly ambitious people that are capable of building large global companies from India, and that's what we care about the most, and that's what we are seeing a lot of. And it's not just ambition, I think what we are seeing is also the deepening of the ambition and the widening of it. I'll unpack that um, now. So by deepening, what I mean is, if you go back maybe 20 years, India was the back office of the world. Like we had, I think our best innovation back then was a business, what was a service model innovation. Like we were trying to service companies elsewhere with more efficiencies built out of India. And fast forward maybe 10 years, we became more of a, I would say, a business model innovation country. We were taking a large incumbent like, let's say, you know, Salesforce or SAP, and we're building their products for a market that was underserved, either in the US or elsewhere. We were more of a business model innovation country for about, you know, five, 10 years. Now we are finally becoming what we care about the most. We are becoming a tech and product innovation country, right? The, company, the companies that are coming out now over the last five years, companies like Postman, Hasura, companies like, you know, like Pixel Space in the satellite business, Next Billion in the mapping business, and so many other examples, they are essentially building world-class products from this part of the world. That's the deepening of the ambition that we are seeing a lot more. It's not just about taking a bigger company and trying to tackle it with cheaper costs and lower fees. It's about building the best-in-class product on day zero and going to the global market on day zero. That's what we really care about, that's what we're seeing now. That's the deepening of the ambition, which is exciting for us. Second is a widening, right? I don't know how many people know, but one of the world's fastest growing open source companies right now sits out of Kochi, a company called Hopscotch. Um, we invested in one of the world's fastest security protocol coming out of Jaipur, a company called Project Discovery. Um, Superbase is building out of Singapore, one of the world's most popular Firebase alternative, open source, right? These are things that you would not have seen coming out of like anywhere, maybe let's say beyond Bangalore. But we, are, we have invested in the fastest SaaS company called Hubilo out of Ahmedabad, Jaipur, Kochi, Singapore, and Bangalore, and Delhi, and Bombay. So that widening was not there five, 10 years back, and that's really exciting for us. That talent is now everywhere, and it's building world-class companies from here. Clearly indications of some exciting times ahead. Thanks. Gaurav, I'm coming back to you. Um, you know, ShareChat, of course, the scale that you guys have achieved is mind-boggling. I'm curious to know what aspects of developer ecosystem made it possible for you to kind of build and scale? Right. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, we are very grateful for the love that, you know, the Indian audience has shown and, uh, you know, in terms of using our app and adopting our app. Um, you know, in terms of our journey, we uh, just over two and a half years ago were like around 60 million users and then you know we had this rapid um, growth both on the main share chat app and also the events that followed in terms of uh, us launching app uh, the the mod app and um, so what uh, has really helped us is the fact that um, the infrastructure that we built uh, you know a microservices architecture which has over 250 odd microservices um, which we built on the Google um, Kubernetes uh, environment on GKE, but really on Kubernetes. You know, we've always taken kind of an open source, open standards approach to things. So that architecture, you know, really helped us scale. Um, the architecture we had two years ago is fundamentally the architecture we have today. 
And there are a couple of things that have helped us on this journey. One is uh, using a lot of the infrastructure services uh, from the cloud has helped us focus more on building uh, customer, user, creator-centric features and allowing our teams to um, focus on those innovations, uh, right? And um, there are open source technologies we use, products we use. So just to give a sense, you know, we use both um, Google provided services, but also we host some of our own services. So, for instance, you know, we use um, we use Kafka that we host. We use um, uh, you know Redis and MongoDB, and getting those through the Google Marketplace also helped us cut a lot of time to launch those services. Pretty much, you know, with a single uh, click deployment. Um, the other thing that helped us quite a bit is. Uh, in terms of being able to maintain the razor sharp focus on um, you know the high value uh, items and solving for uh, real impact um, is that the infrastructure gave us a lot of single click services so for instance uh, data migration between services or databases um, you know that was one thing where we didn't have to spend lots of time writing scripts from scratch uh, spinning up new databases um, you know, so we use like uh, you know big um, spanner and and big big table. Um, those you know we literally like went from seven x uh, user growth, and the infrastructure you know the same infrastructure was able to very nicely scale up. Um, and and of course you know the overall developer ecosystem around um, you know using technologies such as GoLang that we are investing heavily in. Um, so we started out as Node, and we have seen tremendous, um, you know, promise and potential. So we are on this journey to migrate everything uh, to GoLang, and looking a lot at a lot of other standards like uh, gRPC, um, and, um, and and you know, we use like, for example, uh, Netty gives us a lot of scale. Uh, we've managed to have like a million concurrent users, for instance. Uh, so really, it's I think it's basically sort of the open standards, open. Uh, source culture, um, readily available in most cases, um, on the cloud, with the right tooling, with the right automation. You know, security, for example, being an important one. Uh, you know, a lot of the out-of-the-box point-and-click security settings have really helped us. I think that's kind of been primarily what has helped us on our journey. Thank you. I mean, it, there's definitely a lot of lessons to learn there. So, Prasad, I come to you. Um, you know, with uh, UPI pretty much opening the entire landscape for fintech to innovate. What role of uh, developer ecosystem is helping, especially when you are really making a decision between whether bank is going to build on your infrastructure or a third party developers are, you going, to, are going to be engaged? Yeah, so I think given the opportunity ahead of us, given the number of problems that need to be solved, there is no way one entity can pick all of it. So we need to move at speed, and the only way is, you know, embrace uh, multiple ways of getting things done. So even today, a uh, few of our key solutions are actually built by fintechs, right? So we have a company here in India who's building a very critical system, which we will be launching shortly. We have a company based out of the US. So we have already embraced that particular approach. Uh, we are in the process of uh, announcing and launching a startup program as well, so that, you know, more People can come in, understand which problem they want to pick up, and then help uh, solve those. Uh, we have a very active uh, API strategy. We have a developer portal where you know the APIs are documented and, and made available. So I think in a nutshell, I think gone are the days where you felt one large institution could you know pick on everything and solve everything for itself. Uh, today, the pace at which you want to move things, the way digitization is happening, the way in which you want financial inclusion, you have to tap into the entire ecosystem. And yeah, would, would love for many of you all here to pick up some of the problems and, and help innovate. Thanks, Prasad. Venkat, um, over to you. It's an interesting question around providing solutions. And Intel has been sort of a bedrock of compute uh, with uh, renewed interest that is there in software addition to hardware. Um, more recently, you launched the, relaunched the entire developer uh, portal. Um, I wanted to understand a little bit more about Intel's focus on solutions with specifically sustainability and energy efficiency in mind. Okay. 
So yeah, first of all, uh, thanks for highlighting the software piece. And many people don't know that Intel does provide quite a bit of uh, software tools and libraries. Um, if you look at the sustainability piece, as you are referring to, right, Intel is in a unique position because we cover the entire spectrum from hardware to software, right? So at the fundamental hardware level, when we produce CPU, we make sure that it's a sustainable process, being net water neutral by 2030, or making sure the supply chain um, is becoming carbon neutral. So we have a public commitment that our CPU would be carbon neutral by 2030, and then the entire company would be net carbon neutral by 2040. And we are already net water positive in India. Our operations are, we are contributing more water than what we use. So we are on the, we are on the sustainability journey when you look at the hardware piece, right? And then second, second part is, when you are using the hardware, at the CPU level, at the rack level, we have tools to control the energy consumption. So you can control how much power you are using, how much power is required for the performance that you need. So in a sense, a developer can control the heat being emitted at the CPU level. That's the second part that I want to address. And then third part is the whole efficiency piece, right? So how you can have more performance out of the CPU using the software tools, whether it is libraries for AI or big data, or by choosing the right instances for compute or memory, you can pack more performance for the same CPU or the same instance on, on Google Cloud. So we work with partners like Google Cloud to have solutions that are highly optimized so that US software consumes less power. That's the third piece, starting from hardware, configuring the hardware, and then third, how do you code, how do you deploy the software on the public cloud? You have the control on how much power and how much carbon you are emitting. Those are the three areas that we broadly work on. And beyond that, we have the software tools for sustainability and the optimization piece that, that I will talk about more uh, in the upcoming question. Yeah. Thanks, Venkat. Himan, you, have, you almost have a ringside view of all these startups and, and budding companies, and therefore the developer uh, ecosystem. So uh, specifically in the cloud space, what kind of portfolio of developer products would be of most use in your view? Yeah, so, I mean, look, developer productivity has been a constant you know, flywheel of companies coming in and coming out, right? So productivity is a, is a moving target, so we tend to keep looking for where the next gap in productivity is coming from. Um, there are a couple of trend lines that are very, very clear and clean for us. One is the adoption of open source is pretty much, you know, it's a, it's a done deal now. You have to, if you're servicing the, the developer uh, as a buyer, you have to have something that has at least a bottoms up sales motion where you have to convince somebody without really convincing them because developers hate getting sold to. Without convincing them, you have to convince them this is the right tool in the gamut of tools available to you. So that's one trend we are seeing that bottoms up, go to market with a top down education motion is important and we're seeing that a lot in companies uh, from a go to market perspective. Second is the role of open source. You know, developers, it's a fine balance to create. You give everything open source, but you don't support it, you know, it's, it's not useful enough. So you have to really build this community that really talks about your product and, and adopts it in the early days and becomes a champion for the product. But also, you're going to have to build a business around that. So pricing becomes important. How do you tier that from a community edition to an enterprise edition is very important. How do you educate the market about whether this is useful or not is very important. Those two are the go-to-market trend lines. In terms of things that we really, really are seeing from a technology perspective, look, I think the big, big gaps are in security, APIs, um, um, uh, tooling that allow more infrastructure stuff, so like Firebase alternatives are coming up quite a lot. Database alternatives for different use cases are coming quite a lot. Uh, we are now seeing a bunch of companies that are trying to service or build, let's say, a Firebase for blockchain or Web3. Like, what does that look like, right? So things like that. Uh, what does the, um, let's say, a developer tool for Web3 crypto look like that allows you to test and launch code really quickly? What does the launch darkly of Web3 look like? So we are starting to see the ecosystem that was built over 20 years in Web2 
starting to replicate in, in Web3. So that's a big area of investment, and we are looking at that very deeply. And within developer ecosystem, security primitives are coming up always. We're looking at developer infrastructure tooling and so on and so forth. So that still continues to be an area of focus for us. Thanks, Hemant. Well, uh, that's about the time that we have for this technical panel. Some great insights from our technical panel today. I personally love how the technology drivers and perspectives from various industries, the traditional banking bigwig, one of the fastest growing digital natives, um, and valuable insights from our venture capitalist firm as well, and partner who have been the strong pillar in our uh, tech industry for a while now. Thank you to our panel, Gaurav, Prasad, Venkat, Hemant. Really appreciate your sharing your views. We have a we have a power pack day lined up both today for all of you as well as tomorrow on various tracks. Happy learning and iterating with each other. So thank you again. Thank you. I'd, I'd, I'd now like to bring on stage the Vice President of Engineering and Head of India Development Center of Google Cloud, Anil Bansali. Anil? Hello, everyone. I hope you guys are enjoying the session so far. All right, let's hear it for our esteemed set of speakers and panelists. So it gives me immense pleasure to be here today and address this community. Um, you know, in the morning, Bikram uh, spoke about how engineers and developers are the building blocks of the evolution of cloud and are shaping the future of technology. Now, I've been part of this community for over 30 years now, and I've seen it evolve to becoming cloud first. Now, Google, as you all know, uh, has been at the forefront of a lot of technology revolution in the developed markets and in India. And the center of all the innovation has been around the cloud. Uh, today, we are witnessing the transformational power of the cloud, and we are seeing its potential uh, to benefit one and all. You know, cloud computing, advanced analytics, and AI are enabling digital transformation of organizations and businesses across uh, sectors at an unprecedented scale. Uh, now, at Google, we've been privileged to partner with India for over 15 years in its uh, trajectory as a breakout digital nation. Uh, the opportunities in India are like, immense, and that is the potential that we want to unlock with Google Cloud. Now, India, as you all know, has I mean, a talented young population, uh, very high internet penetration, a high amount of smartphone usage, and we have this unique opportunity to bring all of this thing together to solve some basic and immediate needs in the country. Take, for example, the youth in the country. You know, 50% of India's population is in the age group 25 and 35. Employment happens to be a big issue. And hence, matching jobs with the skills is a key task. We have a startup, Apna, which seeks to level the employment playing field for the rising workforce in India and beyond. It built one of India's leading professional marketplaces on the cloud with over 22 million users in just three years across 70 plus cities. Now, Apna has been able to accomplish this with a unique AI job seeking algorithm, which was made possible with cloud native capabilities in Google Cloud, including Google Kubernetes Engine, BigQuery, and Vertex AI. Now, as India has transformed through digital, we too at Google have transitioned from being India focused to being India first. Google Pay happens to be a great example of how we started an effort based on the needs for a digital solution in India for payments, and then expanded it across the globe. Now, continuing in the same vein, the digitization of the Indian uh, financial sector has made rapid strides. And Google Cloud is able to develop products and services to handle the unique needs of this sector. For example, as you heard Urs announce uh, earlier today, Google launched Payment Gateway. This is a new Google Cloud product that enables banks to process API-based payments at scale. This product is based on the UPI payment ecosystem in India and enables banks that participate in that ecosystem to achieve high availability, stability, and control. Now, this is a service by the cloud, for the cloud, on the cloud. Now, our mission at Google Cloud is to accelerate every organization's ability to digitally transform its business. And this is possible because of our culture of using all of our learnings from our customers and incorporating that into our products and services the world over. Now, in India, we do have a unique opportunity to providing for diverse customer needs. 
Google is helping a large number of businesses, both large, medium, and small, to serve their customers who are all diverse. India is a melting pot of different languages and unique practices. And to be successful, products need to be as diverse as the customers they serve. A good example of that is ShareChat, a leading social network for non-English speaking users. And that is using Google Cloud to improve performance, app development, and analytics for serving regional content to millions of users. Now, how is ShareChat achieving that? Because Google Cloud makes it really simple. It offers an efficient DevOps pipeline for releasing changes on Google Cloud. It helps pre-scale Google Kubernetes engine for traffic, traffic spikes around scheduled events like Diwali, for example, when millions of Indians send greetings. Google Cloud also enables building new algorithms that process real-time data sets in regional languages and accurately predict what content users want to see. Yet another example of uh, meeting the diverse needs of customers in here in India is the work being done by another startup, OK Credit. This is an Indian bookkeeping company for micro and small businesses in India. As you all know, uh, we have a large percentage of India's population that lives in rural areas. And th this is where small businesses like grocery stores uh, have to provide credits to their customers. Now, grocery stores keep manual records, which we all know is prone to error. How does OK Credit help? It helps merchants do credit account management by providing them with a digital platform to transact and keep records of payments accurately. So, OK Credit nearly serves almost a million customers monthly, and that has been possible with Google Kubernetes Engine, PubSub, and Cloud SQL. You know, our investments in the India Development Center is a testimony to our continued commitment to meet our customers' expectations. We are leveraging the talent in India by growing our development center to address the transformational needs of our customers. Uh, we are building expertise across all the domains of Google Cloud, and that's translating into developing rich capabilities for our global products and services. Uh, the India Development Center is testimony to, to the tremendous talent that exists in India. With a large number of you know, engineering graduates, together with the second largest developer community, uh, the presence of GSIs and ISVs, the potential for innovation in India is unlimited. You know, the other community, the startup community here, has been at the forefront of innovation. And at Google, we've always supported startups. Our accelerator program has helped 116 Indian startups build and scale great products and companies. Together, these startups raised more than $2.6 billion in funding and created more than 12,000 jobs. I'm pleased to announce that we are now opening the application for our next class. This is a wonderful opportunity for digital native startups to get 360 support with the best of Google. I'm really proud and privileged to be part of Google and, uh, and of the Google's partnership with India over the last 15 years. And I'm excited to see where innovation takes us in the future. I want to thank all of you for joining us for today's keynote session, live here in Bangalore and, of course, across the globe. Uh, please do take the time uh, to explore and enjoy the rest of the planned sessions uh, over the next two days. And I really hope that uh, you enjoy the rest of Google Cloud Next. Thank you. I'm Shaquille O'Neal, and I'm the founder of Big Chicken. So you gotta do that at the end when you say Big Chicken. 
Big Chicken is Shaquille O'Neal's emerging fast casual restaurant chain that focuses on big fun, big flavor, and big food. When you're trying to build a national chain, communication is so critical. To do that, you need a great partner. And we're really lucky that partner is Google Workspace. You know, Josh, every time he does a presentation, he just loves Google Slides. As the person responsible for our marketing, probably the best at Google Slides. His presentations is like I'm at a movie sometime. I'm just sitting there going. I've got some great new chicken sandwiches for you to try. Brand new recipes. Isn't there something important we're supposed to be talking about? Good recipe development comes with collaboration. Using docs in Google Workspace gives us the tools we need to collaborate together. Shaquille's life gets crazy busy, as does our entire board. When you want to talk to me, make sure you put on my Google Calendar. Google Calendar is my girlfriend. I don't know anything I'm doing unless I talk to my woman. Google Workspace, productivity and collaboration tools for all the ways you work. Google products provide the information you need when you need it. But why can't you get the same kind of answers for your business? Looker, Google Cloud's business intelligence solution is here to solve that problem enabling you to go beyond traditional dashboards and make your organization's information accessible and useful. Bringing this innovation to business will be revolutionary, just like navigating a city after Google Maps. Looker is Google for your business data. Here's what we mean. What if Google AI were built into the tools you use to store and analyze data at work? Google's Vertex AI Vision takes data like video, images, and audio, and in real time, turns it into structured data ready for business intelligence. Going beyond the dashboard means using Google Glass Enterprise to see insights and recommendations based on your data in real time. More access, more transparency. Now that's Google for your business. With Google Maps, you know if a restaurant is busy before you go, or you can get rerouted around a traffic jam. Looker will help you connect similar dots in a predictive way. A concert in five days will increase foot traffic by 65%. Would you like to adjust staffing and inventory? Yes. Looker and AI lets you respond to changes in demand and turn insights into action. Foot traffic continues to be busy. Encourage customers to visit an alternate shop with a reward card? Yes. Smarter insights mean better experiences and happy customers. So go beyond the dashboard and transform the way you do business with Looker, powered by Google Cloud. We started with the exponential roadmaps goal, zero carbon emissions by 2050. Where our emissions primarily stem from? Device, CDN, networking, and cloud. Our goal is actually to get to zero emissions by 2030. Backstage was built internally at Spotify, so it unifies your tooling, your services, docs, and apps under a unified, consistent UI. We donated it to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Amazing to see how many people at Spotify actually care deeply about this topic. Cloud Carbon Footprint is actually an open source tool developed by ThoughtWorks. The only thing that's limiting us right now is just people hearing about it. It leverages cloud APIs to provide visualizations of estimated carbon emissions. We leverage Bigtable, GKE. It starts not just from the cloud, but it goes all the way out to our end user devices. We want to empower not just Spotify internally, but the broader developer community to reduce their carbon footprint.
Hey, everybody. So I'm standing backstage at the Google Clouds HQ. We're literally seconds away from kicking off the keynote for developer. I am so excited to share our predictions. Are you ready? Let's do this. Hello, everyone. Please welcome Google Developers Vice President, Janine Banks. Hello, welcome to Next22. I'm Janine Banks, and I lead developer products and community at Google. My team and I love empowering developers to build innovations for the future which leads me to the theme of next this year. Today, meet tomorrow. To tell you a little more about how we think about tomorrow, my friends and I at Google Cloud will share top technology predictions for where we believe the cloud is headed over the next three years. Each one of us will share the one prediction we believe will be true by the end of 2025. And we'd love to hear what predictions you all come up with too. You can do that by responding to our original video or creating your own video on YouTube shoot, Shorts or any other social video platform. Just use the hashtag Google Cloud Predictions and tell us all about it. But before we get into all of that, I want to talk about our developer community for a minute. I get most excited about the incredible ideas and new products coming from our community, as well as the opportunity we have to help developers learn, grow, and build powerful systems and engaging experiences. Google's developer community is inclusive. One where cloud developers at every level of expertise are welcome while being challenged at the same time. And being part of Google's developer community creates true economic impact because Google Cloud certified professionals are some of the highest paid in the industry. This same cloud developer community fosters the creators. And by that, I'm talking about the students, the career switchers, and anyone else hoping to become a developer who's encouraged and supported to bring their creations to life. Just like we saw with our partner in Brazil, Soul Code Academy, and one of our newest professional data engineers, Patricia. Take a look. Tecnologia é como se fosse um bichinho que uma vez que ela te morde, não sai mais de você. Eu cursei análise e desenvolvimento de sistemas, só que eu não consegui terminar. Tinha lá aqueles formulários, né? Qual que é o seu nome, seu endereço? Mas qual que é a sua profissão? Eu não tenho profissão. Agora. É a hora de eu retomar. Aí foi onde eu vi a oportunidade do Bootcamp da Soul Code Academy em parceria com o Google Cloud. E seis meses depois, aí foi onde eu recebi o convite para poder fazer parte do time da Soul Code Academy. Só que do lado de lá. Ali o mundo sabe quando o mundo ganha cor? Então nessa hora ficou colorido. Eu, Patrícia, mulher casada, mãe de três filhos, 39 anos, profissão. Engenheira de dados habilitada em Google Cloud Platform. Don't you just love Patricia's story? This is why I'm excited to come to work every single day and the potential of what we can build together with all of you. Speaking of exciting, we recently announced a new partnership with the Drone Racing League. We built new immersive learning experiences with DRL that will blow your mind. You can participate in the Google Cloud Challenge where you can get hands-on with DRL's race data and Google Cloud services. You can predict race outcomes, give performance tips to DRL pilots to help them smoke their competitors, and learn all at the same time. And you even get to compete for a chance to win a trip to the season finale of the League's World Championship. You can get started with the challenge right now. We look forward to seeing what you'll build next as we fly into the future of cloud together. Do you see what I did just there? Fly.
Jones? Okay, okay. <laughs> Are you ready? Let's go! I'll go first. My prediction is, by the end of 2025, developers will start with, with neural-inclusive design, will see a 5x growth in user adoption in their first two years in production. According to the National Institutes of Health, up to 20% of the world's population is neural distinct, with the other 80% being neurotypical. These two groups make up what is called neural diversity. And neural diversity describes the ways people experience, interpret, and process the world around them, whether in school, at work, or through social relationships. And here at Google, we believe the world and our workplace needs all types of thinkers. What do you think about that, Jim? That's right, one in five of us here are neurodistinct. But what is neuroinclusive design? Neuroinclusive design is designed for cognitive and sensory accessibility. One of the things that makes participation in meetings accessible to me is the raise hand function. It allows me to pause the cadence of the meeting to provide an opportunity to share my thoughts. Then we realized that this made meetings better for everyone. It created more structure for everybody, which enabled visibility and broader range of ideas. So neuroinclusive design starts with raising accessibility for neurodistinct people like myself, but everyone benefits. Good design is already neuroinclusive when implemented properly. As an example, when developing interactive and visual features, we need to consider how noise, vibrations, or pop-ups show up in design because it creates sensory stimulation that leads to distraction. Design principles can be made neuroinclusive when you plan thoughtfully for balance, proportion, unity, light, color, space, and patterns. And here are some tips for developers. Number one, design with simplicity and clarity. Number two, remove distractions or extra visualizations like pop-up windows. Three, avoid really bright colors or too much of a single color. Four, stick with a predictable and intuitive user flow. Five, be thoughtful about the vibe you are setting. Do you need music or sounds to set the tone or is that just an extra element that can create distraction? And finally, six, stay away from pressure points requiring a quick reaction from the users. This can add unnecessary pressure. Back to you, Janine. Thanks, Jim. This upfront design thoughtfulness is just so important. How often have any of you been pressured to ship something, but you knew you could have improved the user experience with just a little more time? At Google, we feel that ideation, user research, testing, and marketing disproportionately help teams launch more inclusive products faster. While these are standard practices in software development, when we made a conscious decision to have all types of thinkers included across these phases, our eyes open in so many new ways to be more inclusive. For example, closed captioning in Google Meet helps all of us process information better visually. It also helps people participating in meetings where a different language is used. When you build simple, clear experiences with fewer distractions, your products will inherently drive greater user adoption. In fact, what did I say? <laughs> I predict 5x more in your first two years in production. This is because developers like us will have built belonging directly into our products. So that's my prediction. Now I'm going to pass the mic to some of my friends here at Google Cloud to share their predictions. Thanks. <laughs> My name is Eric Brewer, and my prediction is that by the end of 2025, four out of five enterprise developers will use some form of curated open source. Now, you're probably wondering, what is curated open source? Curated open source is just open source as you know it, but with a layer of accountability. What I mean by that is curated open source comes with support for developers, and the curator in this case will focus on not just finding vulnerabilities, but helping to fix them too. 
to update old dependencies and track new ones. With curated open source, the curators will build in automation for testing, may even offer response-based SLAs. And here's why this is so important for the community. Open source is everywhere. It helps power our electrical grids, water supplies, oil pipelines. It's fundamental to all clouds, most nations, and even widely used in proprietary software. Open source is public infrastructure, and it's a central part of our everyday lives. So now what? Open source is here to stay, but everything it powers is vulnerable. The incidents are real and they are costly. This is why governments are stepping in with regulations like FedRAMP and executive orders to combat cybersecurity. Regulations like these are super important and show us just how deeply security vulnerabilities impact our lives. But in fact, these regulations are exactly why we need curation. Curated open source enables you to depend on the open source beyond the as-is approach we use today. We believe in this philosophy so much that we are already working on it. To help you build secure apps faster, we're releasing Software Delivery Shield. This is a fully managed security solution that protects your software supply chain from source to deployment. And as part of SDS, we have our initial curated open source example called Assured OSS. This service curates open source packages used by Google and makes them available to you, our cloud developers. Google will scan, analyze, and fuzz test more than 250 Java and Python packages for security vulnerabilities on your behalf, and we'll update them as needed. Still don't believe me that developers use some form of curation? How about this? Let us show you what we're going, doing at Google to make this reality. Hi, Aja. Hey, Eric. So let's actually see what the software delivery lifecycle looks like if you use Software Delivery Shield to enforce responsible use of open source through policy. So we're going to start with Cloud Workstations, a complete development environment in the cloud. Cloud Workstations is highly customizable, and the version I'm showing today has all the tools and compilers and everything I need, including the brand new Source Protect extension. Actually, right here you can see that Source Protect has flagged a dependency with a known vulnerability. I can fix this right now on my workstation before anything is ever checked in. Now, Cloud Workstation is going to automatically detect those changes, and it's going to redeploy my app on my workstations as needed. This shortens my dev loop and makes me more productive. So when I push my changes, because I'm happy with them, Cloud Build is going to run continuous integration against our code base. Here, you can see a Cloud Build build report, and you can see that we provide Salsa Level 3 compliant build provenance. Cloud Build also scans for vulnerabilities. And here we can see a list of vulnerabilities, including details on many of them, and in some cases, even the fix that we need to make to address it. Now, it happens to be that the image that Eric and I are working with today has several external open source dependencies. For example, Spring Boot Starter. In general, pulling these directly from the internet could pose some risk. Fortunately, that dependency and many others are in the assured OSSS portfolio so that I can use a version of that dependency that's been vetted by Google, which is what you've been telling us about. This is exactly the point. You don't have to worry about these dependencies because they are already vetted for you. And so now that I know that I don't have to worry as much about these dependencies, it's time to push the code to prod. So let's actually look at a delivery pipeline. Here's a cloud deploy delivery pipeline. Super simple one. We've just got a dev and a test environment. And when I'm happy with my code and dev, I can promote it to prod. And we can deploy to GKE. So while that's deploying, let's look at one last thing. Here's the new GKE security posture page. Here I can see security concerns on both the cluster and workload level. I can dig into any concerns if I need to including seeing recommended actions to take to mitigate any issues that were identified. So that's the dev to prod tour of Software Delivery Shield, so you can see how it helps you use open source responsibly all the way from the, when you start writing code to when it's released into production. That was great. Thank you, Aja. We love co-creating. <laughs> We just want to make sure there's an added layer of accountability to better support you and the apps you build. This is why we believe that four out of five enterprise developers will use some form of curated open source. Thank you.
first off, it is so nice to see everyone here in the room. Give it up for being back in, in person, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So, hello, everyone. My name is Iman Ganizada, and my prediction is that by the end of 2025, 90% of security operations workflows will be automated and managed as code. Okay, so SecOps teams are struggling to keep up with the attackers. We all know this, right? There's, there's too much data, complex technology environments, and there's more adversaries now more than ever. I mean, every day on the news, we hear about a new 18-year-old that has breached a company, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's go ahead and let's, let's pair this with the detection and response workflow, which is notoriously centered around toil, and it requires a linear growth in people to keep up with the volume of threats. But we all know we can just hire a bunch of more people, right? Like, every CISO has a billion dollars in their bank, and, you know, they're just waiting to hire 700,000 people. <laughs> so this inefficient workflow has basically created the cybersecurity talent shortage. There's over 700,000 unfilled cyber jobs. And these jobs, they're, they're high stress, they're overloaded with toil-based work, and uh, a lot of folks are quite frankly just burnt out. So there's just no way that this issue is gonna get solved if we keep doing things the way that we're doing them today. So to scale security across cloud, we're gonna make security more agile and accessible to everyone through code. Here's how. So, our autonomic security operations framework is designed to help you take advantage of our API-first approach with Chronicle security operations and other tools, including many of those tools that are within our new Mandiant portfolio. The shift in our, our new framework takes traditional assembly line security operations workflows into a codified continuous feedback model we call continuous detection, continuous response, or CDCR for short. You can imagine it's, it's kind of like CICD, but, but for threat management. We've seen customers like BBVA and NCR, and as well as our MSSP partners like Sideris, use our tools to build continuous detection and response workflows that scale across billions of alerts. And so earlier this year, we actually partnered with MITRE Ingenuity, with Sideris and others, to launch Community Security Analytics. CSA is an open source repo that we created to foster community collaboration on developing security analytics for your cloud workloads. These analytics can be deployed as code to complement the native detection capabilities in Chronicle and other Google Cloud tools. So it's, it's kind of like having a team of devs collaborating on your detection rules. So I'll show you how to deploy these rules, but first let's actually dive into an example, okay? Let's just say that there's a user outside of your DevOps team that gets access to impersonate a highly privileged production service account. That probably wouldn't be good, right? <laughs> so yeah. So, to, rule 2.20 analyzes your admin activity logs for permission grants on service accounts. And for this next part, we went ahead and pre-recorded this because we wanted to save time and also, I don't want to have you watch me fumble over my keys and take down US East or something. <laughs> <laughs> so first, we're starting in the terminal and we've already cloned a private repo here. Now we're gonna go ahead and open up that URL rule and we can add parameters to fine tune the rule to our needs. So in case you haven't noticed, Chronicle's URL syntax is very, very, very simple compared to other detection languages. Now we're gonna go ahead and commit and push our changes, and we already have a GitHub action set up to auto-deploy these rules into our Chronicle instance. And by the way, Chronicle can be deployed as code, and it can scale across petabytes of data without needing infrastructure or human involvement. I mean, it's, it's as cloud-native as they come. Okay, so we're gonna pivot into our Chronicle instance, we're gonna refresh, and let's see, voila, okay, boom. So there's our new rule, and from this point on, it's gonna start alerting when this malicious activity is identified. We can also run a retro hunt, which essentially takes this rule and it runs it against all of our historical data in Chronicle to see if there's an alert that we missed, and we've done retro hunts with customers that have taken seconds or minutes that may have taken them hours or days with their existing tools. I mean, it's like it's uber fast. We can also use Chronicle SOAR to create a, uh, an automation playbook, basically to figure out how to respond to this type of alert. And we also have, autom we also have APIs to automate this entire thing from ingest to analytics to response. So the moral of the story is what? Um, none of us want to end up on the news, right? 
<laughs> so, so in order to make this 90% prediction a reality, security analysts are going to have to work a lot more like devs so that they can free up time to focus on the most important threats to their organizations. So you'll need to implement modern, developer-friendly workflows like CDCR across your detection and response practice. And what I've shown you today is how we're making it possible for you to do so. Thank you. My name is Camilia Ariafer, and my prediction is by the end of 2025, AI is going to be the primary driver for moving to a four day work week. <laughs> so, what does this mean to you and me? A three day weekend. <laughs> What, what it actually means is being able to comfortably complete five days worth of work in four days or even less with efficiencies gained through AI. Enterprise use of AI alone exploded over the past few years, touching all aspects of business. One of the greatest reasons behind this is AI's huge potential to increase employee productivity. You have told us how excited you are to work with Google Cloud because we make all of the AI research, AI models, and ML toolkits from Google available to you as enterprise-grade products and solutions, like Vertex AI. Since its launch, Vertex AI has helped data scientists ship ML models faster into production by automating routine tasks like model management, monitoring, and versioning. With Vertex AI, data scientists can now build and train ML models five times faster, meaning increased time for experimentation, reduced custom coding, and the ability to move more ML models into production. Today, with the announcement of Vertex AI Vision, we are taking this a step further and providing you with a fully managed development environment for creating computer vision applications. In the general keynote with a smart city use case, my colleague Jun Yang discussed how you can use Vertex AI Vision to reduce the time required to build and deploy computer vision applications from weeks to hours. Now, let's dive into three areas that I, as a developer, am most excited about when it comes to Vertex AI Vision. The ability to use your own custom models, integration with BigQuery, and developing external applications with SDKs. Let's see how. First, in the smart city example, we used a pre-built occupancy analytics model to detect and count vehicles. Now, if I want to do the same thing for bicycles, I can use a custom bicycle detection model in Vertex AI and easily import it into my computer vision application. Basically, if the model works in Vertex AI, then it will also work in Vertex AI vision. Second, I want to use the power of BigQuery to combine video annotations with other information in my data warehouse. By the way, I can also store annotations in the included vision warehouse feature to easily search for insights across my video. By using Vertex AI Vision together with BigQuery, I can correlate traffic patterns with weather patterns or even make a forecast with BigQuery ML to predict future traffic patterns. Finally, I can use the SDK to access process video data and annotations and hook into a live stream of vehicle counts to power other applications or dashboards. It's that simple and it can be applied to one video stream or even hundreds of video streams. This level of flexibility and scalability is unique to Google Cloud. And that's how we help you reduce the development time for computer vision applications from weeks to hours. Not just with Vertex AI Vision, but all of Google Cloud's AI products are built to help you be more productive and delight your customers. For example, using contact center AI, call center teams can manage up to 28% more conversations concurrently. That means a lot, product, a lot more productivity. With Translation Hub, localization teams can translate documents into 135 languages in a matter of seconds which means time saved for other efforts and a more inclusive workplace. 
Similarly, with Google Cloud's recommendations AI, merchandising and e-commerce teams can now drive 40% more customer conversions. That means a lot more happy customers and a happy sales team too. When you put together all of these productivity gains powered by AI across the organization, a four-day work week is a very distinct possibility. <laughs> Thank you so much. Irina Farouk, and my prediction is that by the end of 2025, 90% of data will be actionable in real time using ML. I'm sure many of you are pretty skeptical of this prediction, and that's understandable. A recent survey found that only one third of all companies are able to realize tangible value from their data. And we continue to hear that many of you at trying to fix that by taking on the operational burden of managing data infrastructure, moving data around, and duplicating data to make it available to the right users in the right tools. So then, how do we begin to overcome these barriers before data can be actionable in real time using ML? Since our inception, Google has been focused on delivering highly personalized information that is highly trusted by billions of people around the world. Data is in our DNA. The same data infrastructure that's allowed us to innovate is available to you, and that is why we believe we can make this prediction a reality. Take, for example, our customer, Vodafone. As one of the world's largest telecommunication companies, Vodafone unified all their data so that thousands of their employees can innovate across 700 different use cases and 5,000 real-time data feeds. They now run AI development 80% faster, more cost-effective, all without compromising governance and reliability. So then, how can we help you achieve your own data infrastructure vision? The short answer is in three parts. First, you can't act on data unless you can see it and trust it. Today, we're announcing automatic cataloging of all your GCP data with business context in Dataplex. And you can integrate third-party sources too. What this means is, is that you no longer need to spend days looking for the right data and instead can spend time working with it. But once you find your data, how do you know you can trust it? Have you ever been in a meeting where someone questions the validity of a single data point and then nobody can trust anything that's being presented from that point onward? That's why I'm particularly excited about the new data quality and lineage capabilities in Dataplex, bringing intelligence and automation to help you trust your data. Second, you can't act on data unless you can work with it. To innovate, you've got to be able to use the best tools for the job across all your data. Speaking of the best tools, I'm excited about BigQuery's new support for unstructured data. Now you can be sure that you can, your BigQuery skills will pay off across all your data, from structured to semi-structured to unstructured. It is also important to be able to use the best of open source tools. Last year, we introduced our serverless Spark offering. And today, we're announcing that you can run Spark directly from BigQuery with fully integrated experience and billing. But this is still just the beginning. We have a bold vision for our Spark offering to bring the Google infrastructure magic all without forking open source. Take, for example, MindMelt, the shuffle service powering BigQuery and Dataflow that helps deliver scale, reliability, and performance that you know and love with those services. That's coming to a Spark job soon. 
Lastly, you can't act on today's data tomorrow. We've heard from many of you that you struggle with making real-time, in-context experiences a reality for your own customers. Dataflow, our streaming analytics service, powers critical Google services, and we believe it can do the same for you. With Dataflow, you can use Apache Beam to build unified batch and real-time pipelines. You can start small while having the assurance that you can process real-time events at extreme scale if your application needs it. To summarize, when you can see the data, trust the data, and work with data as it's collected, we can see how 90% of data will be actionable in real time using ML and the incredible innovation that that will unleash. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Andy Goodmans, and I predict that by the end of 2025, the barriers between transactional and analytical workloads will disappear. Traditionally, data architectures have separated these mixed workloads, and for good reason. Fundamentally, their underlying databases are built differently. Transactional databases are optimized for fast reads and writes, while analytical databases are optimized for aggregating large data sets. Because these systems are largely decoupled, many of you are struggling to piece together different solutions to build intelligent data-driven apps. For instance, to provide personalized recommendations for e-commerce, apps need to support both transactional and analytical workloads on the same data set and without negatively impacting performance. At Google Cloud, we're uniquely positioned to solve this problem because of how we've architected our data platform. Our transactional and analytical databases are built on a highly scalable, disaggregated compute and storage system and Google's high-performance global network, allowing us to provide tightly integrated data services. And to help you unify your data across your apps, today I'm excited to tell you more about new capabilities we recently announced. First, data stream for BigQuery which allows you to easily replicate data from transactional databases into BigQuery in real time. Next, database migration service, which provides a one-click migration from Postgres into AlloyDB for operational analytics. And lastly, we support Query Federation with Spanner, Cloud SQL, and Bigtable right from the BigQuery console to analyze data in transactional databases. But don't take my word for it. Let's see how some of these technologies remove barriers for our fictitious company, Symbol Bank. Symbol wanted to integrate their core banking features in their app with market data to provide personalized, real-time investment dashboards. The problem was their app's backend was optimized for transactional workloads. So how do they maintain the responsiveness of their app while ad adding analytical goodness? Symbol Bank chose Google Cloud's new fully managed Postgres compatible database, AlloyDB, offering the capability to analyze transactional data in real time. Now, migrating all their existing data with minimal downtime felt like a big lift for the Symbol engineers. But it turns out that database migration service makes this simple. And I'll walk you through just how easy it is. Database migration service lets you migrate from Postgres to AlloyDB with continuous replication, minimizing downtime. Once we define where we're migrating from and what we're moving our data into, we can see the prerequisites for the migration directly in, our, in your UI. Sources are defined using profiles which contain host, username, and password, and you can predefine them like I've done here for Symbol's Postgres instance. Here we define our destination and some basic configuration options, and then we get to hit Create. This part will take a few minutes, so I've sped up time a little bit. Once it finishes, a quick test to ensure that it will all work, and then hit Create and Start. Once the initial dump is finished, we're now in a state where we have both the old 
and new database populated with our live data continuously replicating from old to new. And that means we can do cool stuff like testing the performance of our new investment features against both the existing production Postgres database and the new AlloyDB database side by side. Since AlloyDB is fully compatible with Postgres, you don't have to make any application changes. And as you can see, we're getting much better performance out of the new AlloyDB backend. AlloyDB is four times faster for transactional workloads and up to 100 times faster for analytical queries compared to standard Postgres, making it the perfect database for these kind of hybrid workloads. We all want to act on data in real time without the toil of infrastructure assembly and operations. We've given you a taste of how Google Cloud makes it easier for you to build data-driven apps on a unified platform. And this is why I predict that by the end of 2025, the barriers between transactional and analytical workloads will disappear. Thanks. My name is Amin Vadat, and my prediction is, by the end of 2025, over half of cloud infrastructure decisions will be automated based on an organization's usage patterns to meet performance and reliability needs. At Google, we believe the work we do today with our partners will define the next generation of infrastructure for the world. While some people look at infrastructure as a commodity, we see it as a source of inspiration. This inspiration comes from delivering capabilities not available anywhere else and pulling in the future by operating at a level of reliability and scale that might otherwise seem unimaginable. Our infrastructure is designed with the scale-out capability needed to support billions of users who use services like Search, YouTube, Gmail, and our cloud services each and every day. We pioneered the model of entire buildings operating as a single computing and storage system. And with Spanner, we showed how services could run reliably at scale across the planet. And we've experienced network innovations like Google Global Cache, B4, and Jupyter, shortening distances across the planet. This gave us the opportunity to reimagine what was possible from infrastructure in terms of scale and capability. Look at the world around us. The time for disruptive innovation has never been more profound. We're seeing incredible demand on the industry's infrastructure, yet simultaneous plateaus in efficiency. You and your companies continue to push the boundaries of what infrastructure can provide. Yet the burden of picking the just right combination of components continues to fall on you. To address this, we've engineered golden paths from silicon to the console. These paths combine purpose-built infrastructure, prescriptive architectures, and an ecosystem to deliver workload-optimized, ultra-reliable infrastructure. So let's talk about the investments we're making in infrastructure at Google in power and performance to make all of this possible. We partnered with Intel to co-design and build custom silicon like this little thing. This is called an infrastructure processing unit, or IPU, and it gives you massive performance and scalability to power high-performance, data-intensive apps. These IPUs are at the heart of our new C3 VMs. C3s include the latest generation Intel Sapphire Rapids processor, and custom designed offload based on the IPU that delivers 200 gigabit per second low latency networking. And coupled with our new block storage, Hyperdisk, they can provide incredible storage performance. Now, let me show you something else. From the, big to the, from the small to the big, meet the hardware behind the new Tensor Processing Unit, the TPU v4 platform. It's likely the world's fastest, largest, and most efficient machine learning supercomputer. This liquid-cooled board is a beast in both power and performance density. You see these pipes running across it, running chilled water over the board. They're there to ensure you extract the highest level of efficiency from this hardware. It allows secure, isolated access, and is at the cutting edge of services like natural language understanding, recommender systems, and image processing. The TPU makes large-scale training workloads up to 80% faster and up to 50% cheaper compared to alternatives. When you talk about nearly doubling performance for half the cost, you unlock your imagination in terms of what just might be possible. The same IPUs and TPUs that power your services are the foundation that will enable us to automate over half of cloud infrastructure decisions in the next couple of years. They will support the telemetry data 
and ML-based analytics to proactively recommend the best infrastructure. It will be based on an understanding of how infrastructure balance points correspond to performance and reliability for your individual workloads. We don't think that you should have to think about hardware specifications. That is last generation cloud thinking. You will specify a workload and will quickly recommend, configure, and place the best option for you based on your price, performance, and scale needs. We know that these automated, adaptive decisions deliver lower cost, more performance, and higher reliability than any handcrafted solution. So is my prediction that over half of cloud infrastructure decisions will be automated based on an organization's usage pattern correct? Honestly, I think it's going to be much higher than that. It has to be in order to keep up with all the advancements you're making in technology. The burden and complexity of infrastructure decision making you have today will disappear through the power of AI and ML automation. And when you have freedom to focus on your solution delivery, the rate of innovation and customer benefits will only accelerate. While cloud has been transformative, we are still at the early stages. We're excited to continue to make the unimaginable possible and the possible easy. Thank you. Hi, my name is Teron Giannini, and my prediction is that by the end of 2025, three out of four developers will lead with sustainability as their primary development principle. For the longest time, the focus was elsewhere. We needed to build it fast, build it securely, build it as simply as possible, build it at the lowest cost, build it reliably. Well, now it's also time to build it sustainably. We can't ignore the urgency required from all of us to meet climate targets. And while organizations are moving in the right direction, they struggle to take action. 65% of IT executives said they want to improve their sustainability efforts, but don't know how to do it. 36% of them said they didn't even have the measurement tools in place to track sustainability progress. So, how can we help them out? We can give them better data about the environmental footprint of their business. So today, I am excited to announce that Google Cloud Carbon Footprint, which helps you measure, report, and reduce your cloud carbon emissions, is now generally available. <laughs> Let's take a look. Right from the Cloud Console, you can access the Carbon Footprint dashboard of your account. The underlying methodology is quite unique and is based on actual measurements of the energy used by machines in our data centers. It is also the complete picture of your emissions. Not only um, emissions coming from electricity production, but also on-site fossil fuel emissions and other embodied emissions coming from data center hardware. This is also known as scopes one, two, and three. And of course, you can break down the data by Google Cloud Project, Google Cloud Region, and Google Cloud Product. With a simple click, you can export your cloud emissions data to BigQuery for further analysis and to provide your sustainability teams with the data they need to report on your company's emissions. We also want to help you build new applications that emit less carbon by making the right choice at the right time. Let's say you want to deploy a new application to the US West Coast. From a latency perspective, all of these options are very similar. Without more info, you might have picked Las Vegas, which happens to have a relatively carbon-intense electricity grid. But up in Oregon, you'd find a very clean grid, full of hydropower and therefore low carbon intensity. That is why it is indicated as a low carbon region. In fact, a simple choice of, a, of Oregon over Las Vegas can reduce your gross electricity emissions of running that app by about 80%. And with this move, you not only saved carbon, you also saved money 
since a compute engine VM is cheaper in Oregon. A move that can help you save money and carbon is easy to make. When we tested this feature, we noticed new users were 50% more likely to choose a low-carbon region when they saw the icon. And that can make a very big difference. So, how do we make it easy to identify more opportunities to lower your carbon emissions and deliver those options at scale? Well, Active Assist now shares recommendations to remove idle resources and their associated emissions. Actually, all of the sustainability features I just showed you today are embedded into Google Cloud Console and documentation. They are available out of the box, at no charge, and for all developers. Sustainability is too important to be complicated. Before I go, here are two things to remember. One, moving to Google Cloud gives you the efficiency gains and energy benefits to reduce your emissions. Two, when you build on the cloud, pick the region with the lowest carbon impact for your application. Because these tools are available, I believe that by 2025, three out of four developers will lead with sustainability as their primary development principle. Thank you. Everybody. I don't know why I did jazz hands. Let's play with that weird energy, though, together here today. Let's go. Good. So, hi, my name is Richard Siroder. My prediction for you today is that by the end of 2025, over half of all organizations using public cloud are actually going to freely switch their primary cloud as a result of all these new multi cloud capabilities available. So, quick story I recently moved from the Seattle area to San Diego after a vacation this year with my family. We realized we needed something different. So, I bought a house in San Diego before I finally sold the house in Washington. And for a weird time there, I was multi-house. And that was not good. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't my desired end state, but that's OK. Sometimes you're in these multi-situations while you transfer from one state to another. And that's related to my prediction here. I think in the years ahead, we're going to see companies use a multi-cloud strategy not just as a way to hedge their bets, but as a way to actually switch from their first cloud to their next cloud. So research data shows that the majority of companies are actually multi-cloud today. So research data shows that the majority of companies are actually multi-cloud today, meaning they use more than one hyperscale cloud. Sounds probably pretty familiar to most of you. I'm personally talking to more and more companies, though, that are using multi-cloud technologies as a way not to shift their just their workloads, but their mind share to a different cloud as well. So let's see what that journey might look like. What would that look like? Let's look at like three different steps. We'll do some live demos. What can go wrong? So first, that first part of the journey is how do we meet you where you are today with what you got? You probably use another cloud. That's totally cool. Nobody's perfect. But here at Google Cloud, we've made some unique investments in a multi-cloud management plane that works with your compute and your data, even if it's on other clouds. So in this first step, you're starting to use Google Cloud, but you want to incorporate existing investments in other ones. So consistency matters a ton here, and Anthos plays a huge part. Let's see how. So first off, if you'll see here, I actually have an EKS cluster I built, and I've actually attached this to the Anthos control plane. From here, I can manage the cluster, I can view workloads, I can deploy things, I can troubleshoot, I can apply common policies. And even with our recent partnership and collaboration with the Crossplane project, I can actually create and manage GKE clusters, AKS clusters, EKS clusters, provision and manage them all the same way from Google Cloud, which is pretty cool. Now, what do you do with your data? We talked about compute. If I think about my data, how do I analyze all this? We know that data transfer costs are real. Consolidation isn't always the right option. And so for financial, strategic, or even policy reasons, your organization might need data in different clouds. It's OK. So with BigQuery Omni, I can actually have my data lake in Amazon S3 or here in my Azure storage account. And I don't have to move the data to actually run my queries against it in BigQuery. I can actually analyze it where it resides without moving the data. So this is one of many Google Cloud services that actually work wherever you are, whether they run across clouds or actually integrate with the different clouds. It's a big deal. So that's a starter phase, right? I'm building skills. I'm moving, you know, kind of comfort in this new home I have, but I haven't moved really anything. So some of you might think this is where you stop, right? Multi-cloud is just use a bunch of clouds, but I don't think so. I think many are going a step further. 
So in the second stage, you start upgrading your tech where it is and growing your adoption of that secondary cloud. So step two, as I start using Google Cloud Services, let's say things like GKE, which are awesome, I want to use it even more and more. So I might introduce things like Anthos clusters to Azure and AWS. This is the GKE API and GKE software running across clouds, which is amazing. And just now, we just shipped the capability where I can even upgrade those clusters in place on another cloud from the Google Cloud Console. That's awesome. I don't have to jump all over the place to run all my infrastructure. Now here, you might also start creating a multi-cloud mesh and say, look, I want to actually maintain services that run across clusters in different clouds. In this particular mesh, my web app is spread across GKE, EKS clusters, all of these different places. I'm actually able to manage those services and see them and connect them wherever they are. Now let's talk about data. At this point in the game, you might use our great service data stream to redirect your existing Aurora cluster in AWS from Redshift. Maybe you want to steer it to BigQuery instead. And I actually built a stream that connects from my Aurora database and feeds the data in real time to BigQuery. Pretty awesome stuff. So use data stream to move data around as well. So that's cool. So for some, multi-cloud is a bit of a phase. It's not a permanent state. You're not trying to get there. Your final stage could be a full-on migration to your new primary cloud. So once you've invested in Google Cloud, you might start taking advantage of really awesome stuff like GKE Autopilot. This is a fully managed Kubernetes environment where we are running the whole thing. You don't manage clusters. You just deal with your workloads. It's awesome and exclusive to Google Cloud. Now, what's really cool is you may also continue to use Anthos on Google Cloud to manage all of your fleets of GKE clusters at all of our regions around the world. I'm showing you some new dashboards here that are coming out. And this actually, actually lets me manage not just my GKE clusters, but I'm managing on-prem, bare metal, VMware, Edge, doesn't matter. I'm getting a view of my entire fleet and managing that. So now you get things like BigQuery for analytics, you're in Google Cloud, Spanner for distributed data, AIML for amazing insights, all these unique developer tools and more. So look, if you forget everything else that I've talked about here today, remember that Google Cloud has a really unique management plane that meets you where you are, but honestly takes you further. So this is why I believe over half of companies using public cloud today will freely switch their primary provider in the coming years as a result of all these great multi-cloud capabilities. Thanks a lot. I'm Jana Mandic, and my prediction is that by the end of 2025, over half of all business applications will be built by users who do not identify as professional developers today. One of the most interesting opportunities as organizations evolve is that we will continue to see more development work in the enterprise taken up by teams and individuals outside of central IT. The adoption of no-code and low-code tools will unlock this potential by making the development process easier for more users. How many times have you been asked to do something, but you had to say no, because your roadmap or feature request list were already way too long? Well, with these tools, those business users you had to say no to can instead create apps and workflow automations themselves with no programming skills required. These no-code and low-code apps will be built collaboratively with developers like you, who will provide the guardrails to keep the business secure while enabling business users to deliver their own solutions. And I'm not alone in thinking this prediction will come true. Leading tech analyst Gartner forecasts that by 2025, 70% of new applications developed by organizations will use low-code or no-code technologies. That's up from less than 25% in 2020. Organizations are getting ready for this change, and our customers are already moving in this direction. Globe Telecom, a major telco out of the Philippines, reduced targeted business process turnaround time by 80% through experiences built by their citizen developers. And now, it's demo time. Let me show you how Google Workspace's app sheet is making all this possible today and in the future. Now I'm going to be Anne Gray, a business analyst, trying to help my team save time managing request approvals. Currently, the process is manual and disorganized, spread across ad hoc emails and chat messages. So to fix that, first I'm going to build a no-code request approval app, and then I'll show you how my team and I can use this app to efficiently manage our development workflow, our approval workflow. With AppSheet, I have a single place 
to store my data and build my apps. I can also connect to other easy-to-use data sources like Sheets, or with the help of IT, I could connect to CloudDBs. Let me show you the solution that I could build as a business user. Here's my database. AppSheet helps me structure my data and prep it for app building. When I'm ready, I can create a new application with a single click. This creates a prototype app that will be usable on any desktop or mobile device. After some customization, here's what I've built. I have a new request view for users to make requests and an approval view for approvers to do their thing. Each of these views is available to me in mobile apps and desktop apps by default, and I can also configure them to show up in Gmail and chat, meeting my users where they are. Here is my Google Chat app. With this, my users can make requests directly from their team chat space, and it's reusing the same request view I configured earlier. Here's my automation that will send the approval view to the approvers in email. When I'm happy with my app, I can share it with my users, and I can add it to my chat spaces. Throughout this whole process, everything I created is controlled by governing policies set by the company's workspace admin. For example, here's what happens if I try to share the app outside of my domain. AppSheet blocks me and keeps company data secure. This allows IT to do two things. One, keep a clear line of sight on all apps so they can deprecate, update, and retire them when necessary. And two, restrict access to only those users who need it. Now let me show you how my colleague Jeffrey and I can use this app to manage our request and approval workflow. I'll be Jeffrey now. I'm on Anne's team, and I have a request to make. Let me ask Anne how to use her new app. She's added the bot to the space, and now I can quickly submit my reimbursement request. Okay, now I'll be Anne again. I got this email for Jeffrey's request. I can review and approve it directly from here. And if I have a pile of requests to review, I don't have to click through individual emails. I can pop into the app and see everything in one place. This app is accessible to all the users, requesters and approvers. With simple sheets-like expressions, it's configured so the requesters see only their own requests and approvers see all the information that they need. You saw just how easy we are making it for non-technical users to create business applications that meet their immediate needs. With no code and low code, you and your business users now have more tools to work with. This is why I believe that over half of all business apps will be built by users who don't identify as professional developers today. Thank you. Well, folks, that's a wrap on our predictions. We're excited about the conversations this will start and continue with all of you. Remember, if you want to share your own prediction, use the hashtag Google Cloud Predictions to tell us all about it. We can't wait to hear from you. Thank you for your continued inspiration and for partnering with us to build what's next. So. Are you ready? Enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you, everyone. Hi, I'm Shaquille O'Neal, and I'm the founder of Big Chicken. When you're trying to build the national chain, communication is so critical. To do that, you need a great partner. And we're really lucky that partner is Google Workspace. Google Calendar is my girlfriend. I don't know anything I'm doing unless I talk to my woman. Google Workspace, productivity and collaboration tools for all the ways you work.
today. It's uncertain. It's gonna be a crazy day, Huey. It's also unwritten. Look at this. Today is the day we can start to change things. Make things better and make better things. Let's take on problems, big or small. Hey, it's lunchtime. Not yet, I'm coding. Because they're all worth solving. Let's make tech more helpful, more open and accessible to everyone. Let's keep data safe and people safe. Look after the environment and each other. Today may surprise us, push us, even scare us. That's why we're here. Let's take those challenges and make something even better for tomorrow. Please welcome President of Google Cloud International and Head of Google Island, Adair Fox Martin. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Google Cloud Next. I'm delighted to have all of you here with us today. And to the tens of thousands joining us virtually from across the region, thank you so much for tuning in. And for those of you here in Munich, it's been three years, three whole years, since we've had the chance to connect face-to-face -face at a next event, and we have a lot to catch up on. I'd like to take a moment, if I could, to thank all of our partners who've helped to make this event possible. Special thanks to our Lumery sponsors, Accenture, Atos, C3AI, and Deloitte. Indeed, Google Cloud could not do what we do for our customers without the continuing and ongoing support of our partners. And I can't actually think of a more fitting location to bring us all back together. I had the pleasure of living here in Germany for nearly five years, and it's truly synonymous with technology. As a case in point, right here in Munich, it's home to the largest technology museum in the world. But it isn't called the Technology Museum, it's simply called the German Museum. Technology is already applied. And today, we'll be looking at the transformative power of cloud technology and how it can help drive your organization's transformation forward. This is what today is all about, your transformation and how Google helps. And from the main stage and in our breakout sessions, you'll hear directly from our customers about both the value and the experience they are driving via their transformation with Google Cloud. You'll hear how they're solving some of the most critical business problems and also taking on some of the world's most formidable challenges today, tomorrow, and long into the future. So let's get started. To set the stage, let's connect with our very first customers. In the past few years, Renault Alliance and SEB have both aggressively been pursuing transformation strategies. And for both organizations, cloud technology sits at the very core of their transformations. To share more about this bold course of action, please join me in welcoming two leaders, Renault Alliance's Vice President of IT Services, Stefan Van Uck, and Petra Uhland, Head of Tech and the Group Executive Committee member from SEB. Please join me in welcoming to the stage. Great to have you. 